السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أسعد الله صباحكم بكل خير أرحب بكم جميعا ونحن نستهل يومنا هذا مع إطلالة جديدة ويوم علمي جديد للجامعة الليبية الدولية للعلوم الطبية لعام 2020 نستعرض على حضراتكم ما يحتويه هذا اليوم من نتاج معرفي للمتحصلين على التراتيب الأولى لأفضل ما تم عرضه خلال الأيام العلمية لكليات الجامعة لهذا العام أولى فقراتنا كلمة الافتتاح مع رئيس الجامعة الليبية الدولية للعلوم الطبية الأستاذ الدكتور محمد سعد مبارك فليتفضل مشكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين الأخوة الزملاء أعضاء التدريس أبنائنا الطلاب كل الحضور المشاركين وإلى كل البحاث المشاركين في اليوم العلمي للجامعة الليبية الدولية للعلوم الطبية نحييكم في هذا اليوم ونتمنى لكم التوفيق بالتأكيد هذا الحدث العلمي الذي يبرز نتاج و أعمال البحث في الجامعة الليبية الدولية للعلوم الطبية هذا العام له وقع خاص العام الماضي كان هناك مؤتمر دولي أقامته الجامعة عن التعليم الطبي وسيكون هناك إن شاء الله في الأعوام القادمة الكثير من المناشط العلمية التي تطور من الإنتاج المعرفي للجامعة وأيضا للمناشط العلمية بها كل التوفيق للجميع وحييكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مقدمة عن البحث العلمي الطلابي في مؤسسات التعليم العالي بعنوان Undergraduate Research is the pedagogy for the 21st century يقدمها الأستاذ الدكتور عادل التواتي وكيل الجامعة لشؤون التعلم Undergraduate research is the pedagogy of the 21st century. We are going to talk about the impact of research on students, teachers, and the institutions. Then we'll move to talk about the phases of students' development in acquiring, acquiring the research skills throughout their studies. And then we will talk about the importance of integrating research teaching into the curricula and talk about the classification of the curricula based on the degree of participation of students in the research activities. I would like to read these two quotations to show how important research is in higher education institutions. The ecology of a university depends on a deep and abiding understanding that inquiry, investigation and discovery are at the heart of the enterprise, whether in funded research projects or in undergraduate classrooms or graduate apprenticeships. Everyone at a university should be a discoverer, a learner. Research and inquiry is not just for those who choose to pursue an academic career. It's central to professional life in the 21st century. So, what do you understand by the statement student research? It's defined as an inquiry or investigation conducted by an undergraduate student that makes an original intellectual or creative contribution to their discipline. The overall goals of student participation in research is to support and promote high-quality student faculty collaborative research and scholarship, and also to enhance individual and institutional performance 
and for the students with the necessary research skills and serve the, the community for solving current community problems. Students get benefit from being involved in research. Research involvement helps students develop relations with faculty as a result of participation in the faculty research. It increases their retention secondary to actual immersion in the research experience. It also increases their readiness for postgraduate studies. And it helps them develop critical thinking skills, creativity, problem solving, self-confidence, and intellectual independence. It is of research extends to the faculty. It helps the faculty advance their career, enhances teaching effectiveness and job satisfaction, promotes advancements in the research program, it stimulates intellect and increases enthusiasm. It also increases access to research grants and encourages faculty to remain current in their field and promotes greater engagement with students, colleagues and the community. A university is a school which is doing research. So a university to be recognized as such, it has to do research, it has to be involved in research. And implementing and conducting research in the university is likely to produce some benefits to the university. It enhances international ranking, it enhances intellectual vitality of the institution, attracts talented faculty and builds research programs, attracts engaged students and community interests. It brings external funding, which is, can be used in purchasing new equipment and facilities. It encourages innovative and collaborative curricula and it promotes engagement with national trends in higher education and in new research directions. There are different levels of participation in higher education research that students can experience as they take increasing control over the research process. Five levels of student participation in research have been proposed. At level five, students initiated decisions here with the university staff. Students frame their own inquiry at this level and carry out the research. But all of this is done in consultation with university staff at a level determined by the student. This allows the student to gain ongoing feedback when they want it and allows them to develop a relationship with the university supervisor or mentor. This work is usually carried out for individual final year research and the outputs can vary according to the context. For example, while the students may be able to produce a dissertation or thesis, the research could also be presented in alternative formats, for example, as research papers or through undergraduate research conferences. In the fourth level, students make all the decisions and do not consult with university staff. Some students adopt this approach to their dissertation or final project and choose to work unsupervised. This lone worker model may have produced more effective results if the student has received feedback during the process. In level three, where staff initiated the work process but decisions shared with the students. And st but students have a much greater role to play in decision making with respect to the development of the methods, reframing, determining courses of action, and taking responsibility for the outcomes and dissemination. An example is a module where the tutor sets up a series of consultancy projects with local community contacts for groups of students to work on. Second level, students are consultant and informed about the research. About the research. An example is where students join an existing staff research project, perhaps as part of a summer scholarship scheme. In some cases, 
The results of this type of tutor directed research result in co-author papers and allow students to work as a part of research teams. The research is heavily directed, but students may have the ability to influence the project and contribute to its dissemination. The lowest levels, students are assigned but informed. They are informed about their research and why they are doing it. An example of this level, frequently adopted as an initiation into the laboratory-based sciences, is where students carry out routine research tasks following established methods. For students to learn how to do research, research has to be integrated into the curricula taught to the students. All undergraduate students in all higher education institutions should experience learning through and about research and inquiry. For this to be possible, it can only occur if the experiences are integrated into the curriculum. Griffiths, in 2004, first created a typology of research teaching linkages as research-led, research-oriented, and research-based approaches. One year later, he added research tutored as a fourth curriculum style. The four approaches were distinguished on the basis of research focus, that is to say, process versus content, and the role of students, that is to say, students as participants versus students as audience. This led to the creation of four descriptions of curricula. The first one is called research-led curriculum. Here, the curriculum focus is to ensure that what students learn clearly reflects current and ongoing research in their discipline. This may include research done by the staff teaching these students. Second type of curricula is called research tutored. Here, the focus is on students and staff critically discussing research in the discipline, for example, in many seminar-based courses. The third type, called research-oriented, which is based on evidence and developing students' own ideas. The focus is on developing students' knowledge of and ability to carry out the research methodologies and methods appropriate to their discipline or profession. And the last type, the curriculum focus, is ensuring that as much as possible the student learns in research and are in inquiry mode. There is a growing interest in the students going public with the outcomes of their research and inquiry through conferences, websites, and undergraduate research journeys. However, a multitude of formats and styles of research dissemination exist ranging from informal to formal and professional formats and settings. Examples like the blogs and video blogs, broadcasts, online conferences, simulations, exhibitions, theater, poster and paper presentations, Wikipedia pages, web pages, consultancy reports, and face-to-face -face conferences. Each format has different levels of discoverability, access to new audiences, and longevity, and this fact can be used to great effect in tailoring research outputs to the most appropriate audience and level to match the style of work and maintain quality control. To summarize, Universities should do research to be differentiated from other educational institutions. Involving students in research benefits students, staff, and the institution. All undergraduate students in all higher education institutions should experience learning through and about research and inquiry. Integrating research in curriculum brings us more towards research-based curricular structure. Thank you very much.
وصلنا بكم إلى فقرات اليوم العلمي للجامعة 2020 للمشاركات الفائزة بالتراتيب الأولى على مستوى الكليات متابعة طيبة Hello everyone, I'm going to present to you this research an evaluation of the attitudes of the healthcare nurses toward neurotechnology. Uh, the authors of this research is Maran Fadl and me, Ihab al Fallah, and Dr. Abdul Basil Ghriani. The presentation outline introduction, methodology, result, and discussion, and conclusion. Information technology, IT, as we know it, involved with most of our daily activities. Therefore, adopting, implementing, and development of IT become a must. Healthcare services is one of the major sectors of our daily life. And World Health Organization, WHO, defined this engagement by the use of information and communication technology, ICT, for health. Care providers, expert suppliers, are individuals who bring ability at the crossing point of medical services. Nurses are considered a large and important part of healthcare staff. This research aims to measure the acceptance of nurses and their attitudes towards new technologies offered by information technology and health informatic in precise that might improve the overall quality and efficiency of healthcare services provided. Research methodology included the following steps. A selection of research setting and population, selection and modification of the survey instrument, distributing the questionnaire and collecting data, and finally, analyzing the result. First, a review of literature was carried out to identify the characteristic that influences a person's ability to achieve success when using technologies and his or her attitude toward new technologies. A cross-sectional descriptive study were performed and the study setting was in healthcare facilities in Benghazi city. The participants in this study were nurses only. A questionnaire was adopted from M. Hosseini et al. to be used for data collection. Then the questionnaire was reviewed by four faculty members to ensure that it's meaningful and that the items cover the scale that they were to assess. The questionnaire entitled a total of 21 questions that were divided into three parts. Part 1 compromised the demographic and background information of the study sample. Part 2 contained questions on the usefulness of information technology in healthcare. It consists of six statements in three scales. Benefit of information technology in healthcare, pitfalls of information technology in healthcare, and the need for information technology in healthcare. Each statement in this section was responded on five-point Likert scale. The third part was considered with the background of the study on some new technologies. A total of 100 questionnaires were distributed and 96 were returned, making the response rate 96%. Besides, 88% of the participants were female nurses, while only 11% were male nurses. Most of the respondents belong to the first age group, which is from 20 to 30 years old, by 44.8%. Since most of the respondents are considered young, their experience years of work does not exceed 10 years. Only 8% of the participants have completed postgrad study, such as a Master of Nursing or Postgrad Diploma. third of the nurses have computers at home, and they use their computers on a regular basis. The maximum majority of nurses have mobile phone connected to the internet, and they use them for social media related activities. 
Even though most of the participants were young and they own mobile phones connected to the internet, 66.7%, which is more than half of the participants said, they have never used computerized information systems at work. And only 33% of them have worked on such systems. Although the healthcare facilities have provided these systems and acquire nurses to use them. Most of the nurses have a positive view of the benefit of using information technology in healthcare services provided by nurses. This benefit includes information technology saves times when seeking information regarding patient. The use of information technology in healthcare can reduce paperwork accomplished by nurses. In this table, we can observe the correlation between the highest educational level attained by nurses and their views toward the use of information technology in their field. Nursing diploma was the most frequent response by 69.8%. The following tables demonstrate the correlation between whether the nurses have computers at home and their views of information technology. As the table clarified, most of the respondents do have computers at home, have a positive view about the use of information technology in their field by 71.9%. When it comes to nurses' background on the new technologies described in the questionnaire, we can say that they have little to no background on the new technologies available to improve and facilitate their work activities in delivering healthcare services. This might be because of their educational level. In addition to that, they have never been engaged in any training programs. As for their acceptance, the highest percentage of nurses show a positive attitude for information technology in general, and they have the high acceptance to the new technologies because they understand that new technologies will make their work easier by reducing paperwork and saving their times. Furthermore, it will increase their job satisfaction and they can see that the implementation of a new technology is important for improving healthcare services. Regardless of nurses' educational level, which is considered intermediate education and their limited background on new technologies. Their attitude towards information technology in general and the new technologies offered by health informatics in precise are positive, which is a good starting point. Meanwhile, understanding nurses' views and attitudes toward the new technologies prior to the implementation of these new technologies provides an opportunity to correct misinformation through strategies such as education and training. Therefore, there is the need for nurses to be well prepared for the use of and application of information technology. Modern medical advances in knowledge help millions of people live longer and healthier lives. We owe these improvements to decades of investment in medical research. This is an important and powerful quote that highlights the importance of investing in medical research. So on that note, Assalamu alaikum, ismi Yara Masoud al-Tuhami, taliba fi sana khamsa fi kuliyat al-tabb al-bashari. And today I want to talk to you about the researchers that were published from the, de the Department of Surgery in Libyan International Medical University. The first paper was published on the 14th of November of 2019. It was titled, Hospital Acquired Surgical Site Infections at Al Jala Teaching Hospital, Benghazi, Libya. This is a very important topic to research about, seeing how surgical site infections are the third most commonly reported nosocomial infections that affect about 2 million people each year around the world. And it has significant repercussions on patients' health and significant financial effect as well. So the main purpose or the main objective of this paper was to find out the prevalence of the surgical site infections, identifying an as, uh, the associated risk factors, and knowing the organisms involved. So the main method was, uh, that was used 
was a descriptive case study at the Department of Surgery in Al Jalla Teaching Hospital in Benghazi, Libya. So the data that was collected from a total number of 204 cases who underwent surgery in 2018. Their data was collected retrospectively and analyzed accordingly. The results that were found indicated that out of the 204 patients, 14.7% were infected post-surgery. And the most common bacteria that caused surgical site infection was found to be Staphylococcus aureus. And concerning the risk factors, four were mainly identified as being associated with surgical site infections. One, the prolonged operative time of the patient. Two, the extended hospital time of the patient. Three, the urgent nature of the surgery. And fourth, the presence of anemia in the patient. So in conclusion, it was found that the infection rate was higher than that of a developed country. The risk factor were in fact present and identified to have a significant association with an increase in the rate of the surgical site infection and that Staphylococcus aureus was the most common organism isolated. And thereby a list of recommendations were given for the hope that further research would be made on this matter. So a special thanks should be given to Dr. Muthman Tajuri, seeing how this paper was published by him in the Journal of Surgery and Insights. Hello, my name is Sinan Adil Tawati. I'm going to talk about a study that has been supervised by Dr. Ala Adin bin Ismail and Dr. Abdus Salam the study is cited with experts' opinion on the IT skills training needs among healthcare workers. Now, uh, this is the outline of the presentation. At first, we're going to give a short introduction. Then we're going to talk about the problem of the study, the importance of it, then the motivation, aims and objectives, methodology. Then we're going to talk about the results and discussion, conclusion, and at the end, we're going to give a list of references. Now, it's very common that technology that's used intelligently is going to improve the health indicators of people in many countries. An uh, example of that, uh, many countries like in Africa use uh, GPS-based system to track and pursue uh, infectious diseases. Also, a new AE has taken steps to uh, challenge the non-communicable diseases such as uh, high blood pressure, uh, cardiovascular diseases, by using technology to provide uh, quality health services. Now, the goal of health system is to deliver quality services to all people, whether individuals, populations, where and when they need it. In order to do that, they need a well-performing health workforce. Uh, now, this is why modern and new technologies can contribute to improve data generation, compilation, analysis, and exchange which is, of course, going to lead to improve the health sector. Now, for the problem of the study, it has been reported that there is limited information about the level of ICT training among healthcare professionals in developing countries. Also, this study has reported that there is a deficiency of IT skills competence in EU. There is another study that showed that there is a deficiency of key computing capabilities in Kuwaiti hospitals. Now, for liberal organization of policies and strategies recommended that we need to introduce informatics and computing for all departments and health organizations. Uh, now, the health system in Libya actually suffers, uh, suffers from, from massive challenges regarding suppliers, qualities of health professional, administrative complexities, and automation issues. So we can see that the IT skills among uh, healthcare workers in healthcare facilities in developing countries especially are far below the required level for proper functioning of the health system. The importance of the study is that it's going to add much about the actual training needs of local healthcare workers on IT skills. What motivates us to do this study is that, up to our knowledge, the study has not investigated previously in Libya. In addition to that, there is lacking on the studies identifying approaches for e-health workforce development or addressing the IT skills competence absence. The main aim of the study is to determine the training priorities for developing IT skills of healthcare workers at a number of healthcare-related institutions in Libya. We have two objectives. The first one is to identify the priorities of training actions for developing IT skills competence among healthcare workforce. And the second objective is to identify how different our prioritized actions 
from those reported by others. Now let's start with the methodology. As first, this is a cross-sectional descriptive study that targets experts from different healthcare-related institutions. In order to that, participants were recruited on a convenience basis from healthcare workers, whether from hospitals, educational institutions, governments, and non-governmental institutions. Now, all participants were recruited from different cities in Libya, but most of them were from Benghazi because uh, it was more convenient. Uh, another thing is that experts' opinion has been considered as the primary data for the study, and for the secondary data, it has been collected from journals, electronic journals, government and United Nations uh, agency reports, dictionaries, books, and electronic books. Now, as we mentioned, that this study targets experts who work in the health sector from diverse backgrounds, whether those experts were from IT, medical, dental, paramedical, or administrative fields. The issue was that uh, there was no specific definition with the specific criteria for experts, even though many studies define experts as a person who have high level of knowledge or skill in a particular area. But there still was a problem in defining a specific criteria for experts. This is why we used an approach called a relative approach. Now, relative approach is one of the approaches to identify experts. It assumes that expertise is a level of a proficiency that novices can achieve. Therefore, the definition of experts become more relative. This basically studies experts with comparison to non-experts. It can also use uh, different measures, uh, such as uh, academic qualification, uh, years uh, performing the tasks, or uh, consensus among peers. Therefore, the inclusion criteria uh, for participants to be designated as experts are Number one, number of years of specialized experience in work must exceed 10 years, and also number of years where experts use technology exceeds 10 years, regardless of their specialists, whether the experts were from IT, medical, dental, paramedical, or administrative fields, and they must have a qualification degree. For data collection, an anonymous questionnaire has been prepared based on a questionnaire that's already published in EU. The original questionnaire has been uh, modified uh, to, to make it more clearer for participants after a process of discussion with some experts. Uh, so the questionnaire composed of 23 actions that might help uh, to improve the IT skills competence among healthcare workforce. So the questionnaire composed of two main sections, which is that the first section would be the for demographic data, and the second section is for the prioritization of the 23 training actions. Each of the 23 uh, actions had to be evaluated by each respondent four times based on four criteria, which were feasibility, effectiveness, deliverability, and maximum impact. These are the 23 actions from the questionnaire that had to be evaluated by the four criteria. But how we chose those four criteria? which shows them by a methodology called Child Health and Nutrition Research Initiative. Uh, it's basically a systematic priority setting methodology to identify research priorities. It has been reported that this methodology is the most frequently used method in the research prioritization techniques. However, CHNRI method includes a large number of independent criteria, but only limited criteria can be used based on uh, different research needs. Uh, for our study, we only needed four criteria. Those four criteria were feasibility, effectiveness, deliverability, and maximum impact. What we mean by feasibility is that the action is in theory applicable and reasonable. For effectiveness, we mean that the action will have positive impact on improving IT skills if it is implemented. Now, for deliverability, we mean that the action it must be applicable to implement within the current circumstances and resources. For maximum impact, we mean that the action will have great and maximum positive impact on improving IT skills if it is implemented. The response rates were almost 60%. Now, let's discuss the results. One of the objectives is to prioritize training actions based on experts' opinion. So the most recommended action was to help recognize e-health as a specialty. It's actually an interesting finding. It confirms that there is an awareness of the importance of implementing e-health as a specialty.
Even one of the literatures has reported that the lack of recognition of the importance of e-health is the most common barrier to profitable e-health planning and implementation. Therefore, factors that promote this action should be undertaken. Such factors are uh, educational changes, whether in university, Ministry of Education, and Ministry of Labor. Uh, however, promoting health IT as a specialty would help integrating the digital world in the provision of healthcare services. Now, one of the subspecialty that's considered with this integration is clinical informatics and health informatics. So, uh, training and recognition of the certificates of IT specialists with no clinical background right now is separating. However, these certificates uh, need to be recognized by work authority in order for certified uh, graduates uh, to find a place in the work uh, environment. The second most valued uh, action was increasing workforce confidence through exposure to relevant IT solutions and medical technologies. However, self-confidence increased the ability to acquire new knowledge and skills. But the most important issue here is how to increase this confidence. Now, experts in this study suggested that uh, we can increase the confidence by uh, exposure uh, to relevant IT solutions and medical technologies. However, learning to use the new technologies always involve uh, knowledge, skill, and emotional factors. Now, one of the emotional factors that's uh, commonly associated uh, with learning a new technology is the anxiety. Now, this anxiety might result from uh, fear of not knowing how to use technology, a danger of the technology, its improper use, losing of jobs, or a breach of privacy. Uh, one of the, another thing is that one of the literatures uh, reported that lack of sufficient access to technologies impairs the learning and adoption of IT skills by health uh, workers. Now, uh, this uh, human-computer interaction requires strategies to help facilitating it, and this might result in improving the acceptance and use of technologies uh, in the health sector. The second objective of our study is to identify how different our prioritized actions from those reported by others. Now, in order to do that, we're going to make a comparison with uh, a study conducted uh, uh, in the EU. Uh, it's a similar study with the same topic. Now, uh, it has been found that there is a full agreement regarding only two proposed actions, which is the raising awareness of the importance of e-health and uh, help providing inst instructional uh, strategies and resources. Now, this finding shows that these two issues have the same level of priority in both developed and developing countries. However, there is a significant disagreement between our experts and uh, those of EU study. Now, the first disagreement is that uh, the integration of health IT in curricula at both undergraduate and postgraduate level action has ranked the first in the EU, but it ranked 18th in ours. Now, this gives a clue in how European experts look at the importance of integrating IT training at early stages of learning to ensure uh, having uh, graduates with a strong base of uh, IT. Now, the second disagreement is uh, consulting healthcare professionals in the development process of the IT solutions, now which ranked fourth in the EU study and only 16th in ours. Now, this may indicate that uh, the local experts did not give significant uh, priority to such, uh, to such consultation, even though it scored a high uh, value, uh, it scored about 82.2. Uh, now, the third disagreement is that uh, the scores of the EU study has ranged from 47.8 to 85.1, while those of ours has a much narrower range, which is from 71.20. Uh, 0.28 and 92.28. Maybe a possible explanation of this is that the EU experts were more decisive in the, uh, in the prioritizing process of the actions, while ours took at most uh, plausible ones. This might be a reason. 
Now let's give a brief conclusion. At first, we can conclude that uh, locally prioritized training actions are very different from those reported by the EU, and also that the most important actions to focus on uh, here in Libya as a developing country, uh, one is the, to help recognize e-health as a speciality, and the second action is to increase uh, work confidence to, uh, through exposure to relevant IT solutions and medical technologies. Now, here are some recommendations. The first one is, uh, is that we really uh, recommend to conduct a studies uh, on a larger scale involving experts representing all Libya, and that authorities should take the results of this study in a planning and training programs for healthcare workers on IT systems and tools, and also to support programs aiming at producing health IT specialists such as health informatics, and to think of the possibility of initi uh, initiating clinical informatics as a subspeciality for healthcare uh, professionals, and to provide health institutions with uh, instructional strategies and resources. Now, uh, the limitations of the study. Now, this study is a survey-based study with all limitations usually mentioned on reporting such studies, and also uh, the relatively high response rate in our study, which is almost 60%, it might be because of the collegial relationships. Another thing is that uh, the bilingualism used in the questionnaire because we used uh, two versions, uh, an Arabic version and an English version for the questionnaire. Uh, uh, another thing is that uh, for future work, uh, more studies should be carried out uh, on a larger scale uh, representing experts in, uh, in all Libya. These are some of the references that is used in the presentation, and thank you for listening. Hello everyone, I hope you're having a good day. Today, me, Bala Salahuddin Bishwagir, and my colleague Fatma Nasser Hidaj, fifth year dentistry students in Libyan International Medical University, will be presenting our research with the title of Dental Anxiety Impact on Oral Health Related Quality of Life, a cross-sectional study in Benghazi, Libya. Our presentation consists of, first, an overview, the aims of our study, the materials and methods used, the results in discussion, the conclusion and recommendations, and finally, the acknowledgement, Starting off with an overview about dental anxiety or dental phobia. It is defined as the patient's response to stress that is specific to dental situ situations. Despite technological advances in modern dentistry, dental anxiety and fear of pain associated with dentistry remains common. It has been ranked the fifth among common fears in a general population. Also, the prevalence of dental anxiety has been the subject of innumerable surveys for many decades as it varies from 5 to 21% of the general population, depending on the methods of measurement used. Dental phobia has several consequences. First, individuals with high levels of dental anxiety tend to have a regular visiting habit. This creates a vicious dynamic cycle in which the fear of dental treatment lowers the use of dental health and oral health diseases reinforce each other. Second, anxiety or phobia has a negative effect on the dentist-patient relationship, as it can be the reason behind failure or complications for many dental procedures. Next, higher level of anxiety results in medical complications due to stress, such as syncope and cardiovascular accidents. Dental anxiety has many emotional and mental and psychosomatic consequences as it interferes with the patient's individual well-being and substantially affects their oral health-related quality of life. High dental anxiety has been found to be consistent, is consistently linked to poor oral health-related quality of life for many patients in several countries, including the United Kingdom, Germany, Switzerland, and India, based on previous research. Regarding oral health-related quality of life, it characterizes an individual's perception of how oral health influences their life quality. This concept received a lot of attention from psychologists, and different instruments have been developed to measure it. 
there's lack of information regarding death and anxiety and its effect on oral health related quality of life in the developing countries and in Arab countries. So the aim of our study was to collect data on the prevalence of death and anxiety and its impact on oral health related quality of life among adults in Benghazi city. Our basic research design included a cross-sectional study involving a questionnaire of a randomly selected sample of Benghazi population. We distributed the questionnaire by means of Google Forms online and print and handouts on September 2020. The inclusion criteria were uh, people aged 16 to 75 and Benghazi residents. Our questionnaire consisted of two parts. The first part collected demographic data of all subjects, those including the age, the gender, the educational level, and the smoking habits. It also collected data uh, regarding the dental visiting habits and the sleeping quality the night before visiting a dentist. The second part collected information regarding the data anxiety level. We used the Arabic verified version of the modified death and anxiety scale. This scale consists of five questions regarding the anxiety the day before visiting a dentist, anxiety in the waiting room, anxiety before getting a filling, anxiety before getting scaling, and anxiety before getting an anesthetic injection. Each question ranges from one to five. Reproduced total scores ranging from five uh, representing not anxious at all to 25 representing extremely anxious. The cutoff point was made at 19 and above, indicating dental phobia. Uh, the, we, used, we also used the Arabic verified version of the oral health impact profile to measure the oral health related quality of life. This scale consists of five items and it collected uh, information regarding if the participant has felt any difficulty in chewing their foods, if they had felt any pain, if they had felt uncomfortable about their appearances, if they had felt like, if they had any alterations in their taste perceptions, and if they had felt any difficulty doing their regular jobs in the last 12 month period due to oral or dental problems. Uh, the scores ranges from zero represented never to four represented very often and higher scores indicated poorer oral health related quality of life. Before starting off with the results, I'd like to clarify that the collected data were, were entered into spreadsheet and they were statistically analyzed. We used an independent sample t-test to detect the difference in means between two groups where one-way ANOVA was used to detect the difference in several groups. The chosen level of significance was p-value less than 0.05. The total sample size was 717. Uh, where 430 participants responded online and 287 participants responded by printed handouts. The mean age was 28.34 years. Female participants re represented 64% of the total study group, while male participants represented 36% of the total study group. Our results revealed that 114 participants suffered from dental phobia. Those represented 16% of the total study population. Also, this table shows the mean of the dental anxiety level, which is 12.23. The, uh, the phobic male participants represented 11% of the total male population, while the public female participants represented a higher percentage of 15% of the total female population. Uh, regarding the variation between male and female according to their dental anxiety levels, 
uh, we can see that the females had a higher means of 13.02, and the difference of males to females was statistically significant as the p-value was less than 0.05. Next, this table shows the age groups included in our study. Here we can see that participants aged less than 20 years old had the highest dental anxiety mean of 30.35, but the difference between age groups was statistically insignificant because the p-value was more than 0.05. Moving on to the educational level effect on dental anxiety. Here we divided the participants to three groups according to their degree level. We can see that participants with only secondary degree level had the highest dental anxiety mean of 12.47. And the difference between the groups was statistically significant as the p-value was less than 0.05. After ANOVA, a post hoc test was done to determine the significance level between each individual two groups. And it's revealed that uh, the people, uh, participants with secondary level degree and participants with master degrees level uh, differed significantly. Uh, next, we have the smoking effect on dental anxiety. Here we can see that most of our participants were non-smokers and they had the highest dental anxiety mean Although the difference between smokers, non-smokers, and previous smokers was statistically insignificant as the p-value was less than 0.05, which means that the smoking habits has no significant effect on the dental anxiety scores. Moving on to the sleeping quality the night before visiting the dentist. We can see that participants who suffered from a lot of stress and couldn't sleep the night before had the highest dental anxiety mean of 19.02. And the difference between the groups was significant as the p-value was more than 0.05. A post hoc test was done and it's revealed, uh, and it's revealed that participants who sleep normally, those who suffer from little stress and then proceed to sleep, and participants who suffer from a lot of stress and couldn't sleep the night before visiting the dentist, all differed significantly from each other. Now that I've discussed the demographic data and the sleeping quality effects on dental anxiety, I'll leave you with my colleague Fatma Hadash to talk about the remaining results. Hello, everyone. Starting to discuss the result of dental visiting habits and dental anxiety. Like what we see here, the highest response was for individual visiting the dentist only when they feel pain. But the highest mean was for individual who didn't go to the dentist and only take medication. According to ANOVA, the p-value are less than, less than 0.5, which means this is statistically significant. Also, the post hoc test was done, and there is a significant variation between patient routinely go to checkup and patient only when they feel pain and patient when, which only take a medication and avoid visiting the dentist. And it was significant. So then the related dental, uh, dental anxiety and oral health related equality, when we divide our participant to two groups, public and non public group, according to the modified dental anxiety scale and related to the oral health impact profile, we found that there is the highest mean was for public group and it was less than B value, less than 0.5 and it was statistically significant. Now, discussion regarding dental anxiety. This study is carried out to assess the dental anxiety level in Benghazi. So the total mean was 12.23. And when we compare it with other study, we found it similar to study conducted in the Saudi Arabia and India. The prevalence of dental phobia between the population was 16%, which is more than studies conducted in the UK, but it less than studies conducted in the US by white. Starting to discuss the result of our study, which shows there is a significant variation between females and males according to their mean, and it's in agreement to the analysis of oral health survey in the UK. 
Next, the smoking habit, where no significant variation between the groups. In contrary to the analysis of the oral health survey, survey by Newton in the UK. Also, the age group, where no significant variation between them. In contrary to the finding of studies by Anshari and Fayyad, which has reported that older individuals have a lower dental anxiety than younger individuals. Regarding educational level, there is a significant variation between highly educated and secondary level educated in agreement with the US National Health Survey, which has reported that primary or secondary level educated have a higher dental anxiety than highly educated patients. Moving to the phobic patient or individual that have high modified dental anxiety scale score are less likely to visit dental clinic for routine of checkup. And this is supported early finding in adults, dental health survey in the UK and US national health survey. Moving to the open-ended question that we did in our survey, asking about the reason that scares you from your dentist or from visiting the dentist, the highest percent was 22.2 for anxiety toward injection. And it's when we when we share about it and we found that they're in, in it's in finding similar to the Danash adult and Saudi Arabia, the fo followed by fear of pain, which is scored 18.1. The third highest percent was for scared or anxiety toward sound of rotary dental drills, 13.5. Other reasons as fear of, of tooth loss due to extraction according to treatment plan or by accident. Past, past bad, bad past experience, dentist attitude, and proper sterilization, especially nowadays because of COVID-19 and expense. It's an important reason too. Regarding to oral health related equality, as I said before, we divided to two groups, phobic and non-phobic group. And we compared, when we compared, we find the relationship between oral health related equality and dental anxiety. That means high dental anxiety associated with low oral health related equality, and the difference was statistically significant. Despite the limitation of this study, the sample was consists of population in more women and lack of information regarding the annual income. We conclude that dental anxiety differs significantly with gender, education, sleeping quality, and dental visiting. And more importantly, it's associated with oral health related equality. So we know now that there is a relation between oral health related equality and dental anxiety. Identification of patients suffering from dental anxiety is important now. And to get him a proper management treatment plan and avoid any negative experience. We conclude some ways to manage those patients as environmental change to friendly environment, patient control during the treatment by stopping the, patient, stopping the, the, the treatment by raising his hand when he feels pain, Distraction, the, the, the instrument voice, voice by playing amusing to making the patient more relaxed. New dental techniques as uh, dental inject, dental vibe injection comfort, uh, comfort system to painless injection. Pharmacologic management as we use a conscious sedation during the procedure or mild sedative agent the night before visiting the dentist. Finally, for further studies, the development of the study and more research with large sample size should be carried out to further assess those impact of Libya and Libya, sorry. Finally, we would thank Dr. Rabia al Huni and Mr. Tawfiq al for his statistical analysis. This is our reference. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. The title of this presentation is Quality Evaluation of Pharmaceutical Products of a Certain Company Available in the Libya Market under the supervision of Dr. Zahra Abu Zariba and Dr. Nuha Al Mabrook. It will be presented by me, Nabila Abdus Salam, Wala Ibrahim, and Fatma Mahmoud. In this presentation, we will go through first introduction, aim, methods, and materials, results. Last but not least, discussion, and finally, the conclusion and recommendations. Quality control is considered one of the most important aspects in the manufacture of pharmaceutical products. 
meeting and maintaining the defined specifications of various aspects of the manufacturing process, defined by the standards as per official pharmacopoeia. The pharmaceutical market in Libya suffered, suffered poorly since 2011 due to the lack of oversight, regulation, and inspections on the pharmaceutical imports, which resulted in the exposure of Libyan general population to pharmaceutical products that do possess a proof of origin that can be verif verified and traced. The aim of this study is to determine whether generic drugs from X company, which are distributed in the Libyan market, are pharmaceutically equivalent to the standard in the recognized pharmacopoeia or not. Methods and materials. The products were evaluated by using official and non-official pharmaceutical quality control tests according to the Pritch Pharmacopoeia. And then the medications that were evaluated. The first drug is the glapinclamide, is an oral antidiabetic drug used to treat non-insulin dependent type 2 diabetes. The second drug is Votrex, which is Diclofenac, used to relieve pain, reduce the swallowing, and ease inflammation in conditions affecting the joints, muscles, and tendons. Now, continuing with my colleague, Wala. Test that we hear out on this study. Firstly, the hardness test is a laboratory technique used by the pharmaceutical industry to determine the breaking point and structural integrity of tablets. Then, disintegration test, which is used to determine the time that tablets take to disintegrate. In addition, dissolution test was reformed to measure the extent and rate of solution formation from the dosage form, such as tablet and capsule. The content uniformity test is a pharmaceutical analyzed parameter for the quality control of capsules or tablets. The last one is weight uniformity test used to ensure that weight of tablets show little variation within a batch. Looking to the table, the results show that both drugs passed on weight uniformity tests where the sample, uh, the sample percent of deviation were less than 7.5%. And disintegration test as time for both drugs was within 15 minutes. On the other hand, both drugs failed to pass content uniformity, hardness, and disintegration tests. Now continue with my colleague Fatma. Any defect of the quality of pharmaceutical products will raise a concern whether the, the drugs enter the Libyan market are properly evaluated or not. Both the drugs pass the weight uniformity test, which means that tablets of each drug don't show excess weight variation that might affect the chemical content, the flowability, and dye filling during compression. According to the results, the content uniformity test of Declofenac revealed that the tablets contain less than accepted limits while the glibenchamide was higher than the past limit. This might mean that the tablet doesn't contain the correct composition and the suitable dose. Therefore, bioavailability and therapeutic effect of the drugs will be affected. Both the products failed the, failed the hardness test, which is an important parameter for tablet that assists the tablet resistance to breakage as a result of transportation, storage, and handling. The disintegration time for tablet is critical for absorption process as it's considered a determining step. The result were acceptable for both the drugs. The formation of solution of a drug is important to ensure the bioavailability and therapeutic effectiveness after the drug release. The dissolution test result for both drugs were rejected. Also, glibenchamide showed high drug release person, but in correlation with the content uniformity test, apparently the glibenchamide tablet contain high amount of active ingredient compared to the stand stated amount. In conclusion, as demonstrated from the result observed from quality evaluation in both the drugs, it's, it's clear that the X company leaks 
quality control consistency on a multi-production line basis. Hence, both the drugs from two different compositions and ingredients uh, failed to meet the standards set by Bridge Pharmacopoeia on multiple vital quality control tests, including the most basic physical properties, which is hardness test. It's highly recommended that, if excess, uh, that excessive evaluation need to perform for another samples and dosage forms for the same company to ensure the quality of these, medication, uh, of these medications in the Libyan markets. References uh, used in this presentation. And finally, thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, the research was under the title of immunoglobulin isotypes, C3 and C4 complements components, absolute isinophils and allergen specific IgE as biomarkers correlated to preschool wheezy children. As, a, as an term of uh, introduction, uh, or background on wheezing. Wheezy chest is a common problem among preschool children and it represents a common disorder uh, characterized by, um, by airways obstruction. Uh, almost 30% of, of children, um, their parents uh, report such a, such a problem before the age of uh, three and 50% of children uh, their parents also report having problems before the age of uh, six. Um, now, I'm sorry. Now, uh, when wheezing occur for the, for the first time, it seems to be appeared by some sort of a, a viral infection or it's known as the common cold. Uh, in this condition, the, the patient will be diagnosed with uh, bronchitis if a respiratory disorder uh, takes place. Now, uh, uh, wheezing can be uh, classified into two or under two categories, uh, uh, undermitting and episodic, uh, an episodic uh, wheezy or, or wheeze. Uh, the, uh, the etiology or the, uh, the causes uh, of course, are inflammatory, maybe in, um, at, at the first time, and that would be involving uh, T lymphocytes, activated xenophils, and mast cells. Um, yes, uh, the, the rule of, of allergy and the development of, of asthma. During uh, childhood, uh, wheezing is considered to be a heterogeneous condition. Uh, some children will manifest uh, asthmatic uh, asthmatic symptoms in that in that age, and that what what caused or what to be noticed that uh, a lot of cases develop asthma in the uh, adulthood, which came into concern regarding uh, regarding that area. Uh, the question of the study was: Will these individuals, these young individuals, develop asthma later on in, in life? Or not that could appear uh, from uh, from their uh, their condition and by the lab analysis uh, with, within this age as a young learner. Sorry, as a young individual. Uh, okay. As the as the, the the title was was mentioning, the study was about immunoglobulins. Uh, um, let's say all of them, immunoglobulins are, are antibodies. Um, they, they, they are presented in the milk and colostrum of all, uh, lactating, uh, of all lactating species. Um, and they're listed as following. For example, number one, immunoglobulin A is, is considered to be the second most important uh, one after immunoglobulin uh, G. Immunoglobulin G is, is, uh, is the most abundant one. It represents uh, maybe 75% uh, of the total number of immunoglobulins in the entire body. Um, immunoglobulin uh, uh, M, which starts to appear, or the, actually the first to appear by the second trimester, a uh, trimester, sorry, um, uh, yes, it's recognized to, to be the first 
immunoglobulin found in this uh, stage. Immunoglobulin E, which is a, a biomarker for the allergies that, um, that children uh, have at this age, is, is considered to be elevated. So it, represented, it represents that uh, people at this time are having uh, some, sort of, uh, some sort of allergy. Uh, okay, what was, uh, what was included in this study as well are the complement system. Now the complement system consists of almost 20 proteins. What was uh, considered in the study were C3 and C4, complement three and complement uh, uh, four. Complement three um, is of course made of alpha and uh, beta, uh, beta chains. Uh, while uh, uh, complement for uh, uh, activation occurred by splitting into two parts, B and AC4B and C4A. Uh, what was included in this study, and it was a, a very uh, uh, recognizable marker, was the eosinophilic count. Now, patients with, uh, with, with respiratory distress happened to be found with an increased number of eosinophils, so we wanted to dig on that too and see what uh, or, or, or if it was related to the uh, to these patients. Okay, uh, the aim of this study now, as I mentioned, all of these uh, markers, including immunoglobulins, complements, eosinophils. Uh, were all highly related to those who have allergies. So we wanted, or the study wanted to test them all and see if it's possible to, to find these uh, biomarkers elevated with those who suffer from such a, uh, such a condition. So the study hypothesizes that immunoglobulin A, E, M are gonna be elevated with those with recurrent wheezy chest uh, attack. Uh, however, immunoglobulin G will be decreased. Uh, and again, C3, C4, and eosinophilic count will be increased with those who have this condition. Those were the hypotheses of this study. Now, the results might, might agree or disagree with that. So we're gonna see further on. Uh, regarding the materials and uh, methods where were used in this study, the type of study is a case control study as there was uh, two groups compared to each other, the, um, the patients and the controls. Uh, regarding the ethical approval, university's committee ethical approval was obtained by uh, February the 10th, 2019, and Benghazi Pediatric Hospital approval was, uh, was, was obtained by the 30th of March, uh, 2019. All of the participants, including controls and uh, patients, they came with their relatives or parents. So uh, they signed an approval paper for the blood withdrawal and for the uh, results to be published on a study later on. Uh, samples collection, uh, the number of the cases were randomized, 73 cases, 73 cases. Uh, 52 of them were patients, were, were in a critical condition of having respiratory distress, and the other 21 were controls, totally healthy kids, just to compare the results to each other. The material and equipment uh, used, um, uh, editor tubes, three milliliters, radial uh, immune diffusion uh, plate, RID, for uh, immunoglobulin G, A, M, C3, and C4, Euroimmune total IgE kit, uh, Euroline inhalation Middle East kit, uh, Cal Caltech for uh, CBC, and EMB ELISA was used as well. We saw some figures of the uh, of the materials used. The statistical analysis and tests were uh, were done on um, on an application on software on Windows called uh, Minitab. 
uh, and and the um, uh, these tests were divided into descriptive and uh, inference. Now, uh, the, the descriptive, of course, the, the, the term is self-explanatory, while the statistical inference was divided into correlation, one-way ANOVA, and t-test. The results. I'll, uh, I'll be starting with the graphical representation. Uh, now, uh, the figures here uh, show that uh, the first graph of the total number of cases, 73 cases, uh, regarding the gender. Uh, the cases were uh, 48 cases males and 25 cases were females. That's for the total number. While of the patients, there was 34 cases of males and 18 cases of females. Um, as for the uh, as for the age, on the total number, the peak age was six years old. While for the uh, for the uh, for the patients, the ages varied between one years old to five years old. The, those were the highest, while the others were in um, on a closely related uh, ranges. This pie chart uh, represents the uh, residential status of the of the of, of the cases. Uh, Ninety-four point five percent of them were urban residents, while five point five percent were rural uh, areas residents, not from Benghazi. Okay, now to the levels of the uh, of the biomarkers regarding to the immunoglobulin E. 39.7% uh, of the cases of the total number had elevated levels of IgEs, while 60.3% of the cases had normal levels of immunoglobulin E, um, which might gives us a hint towards the uh, towards the answer that the study was looking for from the beginning. Uh, regarding immunoglobulin uh, A, only 23.2% of the cases had elevated levels, while the rest, the 76.8% had normal uh, levels. Immunoglobulin G, 40% of the cases had high amounts, while the other 60% uh, were in normal. Uh, IgM was the lowest, only 16.4% were uh, were with a normal amount while the others were uh, sorry the 16.4 percent were high while the rest 83.6 were in normal condition or normal levels uh, c3 was was as expected high in 68.4 percent of the cases and C4 as well was high in 53.4% of the total number. Uh, regarding uh, the esophils, uh, the results were not as the study expected them to be. 94.6% um, of the total number of the cases had normal count of esophils, while the other 5.4% uh, had elevated, relatively elevated levels of xenophils. Uh, this could be explained in the terms of, of, of normal people. They have normal, normal amount, normal number of xenophils, while the others who were sick, uh, they showed normal amount of xenophils, and that could be explained by the fact that they are under treatment. Their physicians, their doctors are following up with them, so that's why they're having uh, a normal amounts of, uh, of resilience. Okay, so uh, uh, since we have a number and not a not a not a small number of patients who suffered or had elevated levels of IgE, uh, the study wanted to to further search about that phenomenon. Why do they have 
elevated levels of IgE. What kind of allergy do they suffer from? So a specific allergy uh, uh, was, uh, was tested for those who had elevated levels of IgE, and it showed that uh, uh, IgE positive, uh, they were done by inhalation uh, Middle East, showing individual uh, not only allergic for allergy, but many, uh, most of the cases shared uh, dermatophagoid uh, pitter allergy. That was the highest, dermatophagoid pitter and derma dermatophagoid uh, farini. They, they were the, um, the largest or uh, most of the cases uh, had this allergy. And the list goes, uh, goes on. Only two allergenes, they weren't fined in, in any of the cases. Uh, penicillin uh, notetum and uh, cladosporum uh, herbra. These two allergenes weren't found in any of the cases. Uh, coming to the statistical part. Now, regarding the correlation, immunoglobulin was correlated, was related to all of the other factors. IgA, G, M, C3, C4, gender, age, residence, number of attack, manifestation, family history, and eosinophilic count. Now, all of the correlations were insignificant to immunoglobulin, except for three, uh, for three, let's say, factors. The age, number of attacks, and manifestation. Uh, 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 age was, was significant as the p-value was 0 0.005. Number of attacks were significant, uh, significant as well with the um, with a p-value of 0 0.001 and so is with the manifestation with a p-value of 0 0.002. Uh, using the one-way ANOVA, uh, uh, IgE versus the number of attacks, the relationship was, uh, was significant with a p-value of 0 0.011. Uh, and so is with, with the manifestation, it was highly significant with a p-value of 0 0.006. And so is with the family history with a p-value of 0 0.019. Uh, uh, finally, there was, uh, or, or a t-test had to be uh, used in this study, comparing uh, the normals to those who suffered from this condition of the wheezy chest. Um, now, uh, the, the two groups tested to determine uh, the controls and affected uh, individuals. The controls were 21, and the affected individuals were 52. All 13 variables were uh, were included, uh, except for uh, all of the other uh, variables were insignificant, except for immunoglobulin E, which showed a p-value of less than 0 0.001, which showed that it was highly significant. Uh, number of attacks as well, uh, the p-value was less than 0 0.001, highly significant. Manifestation, family history and immunoglobulin, and all of these were significant as their p-value um, was, uh, was low. In conclusion, uh, this study aimed to assess the correlation between immunoglobulins, all of them, IgG, M, E, um, and complements, uh, levels of uh, isinophils and development of wheezy chest. Insignificant correlation was with, was with all uh, variables except manifestation, number of attacks, family history, and most importantly with immunoglobulin uh, E, meaning that those who suffered from such a condition um, had elevated levels of immunoglobulins. Uh, furthermore, all immunoglobulins positive were tested for a specific allergy, and they showed, uh, um, uh, they showed that uh, dermatophagoids, spitter and dermatophagoids, ferini, was the commonest among the other uh, allergies. Uh, uh, that's it uh, for, for this uh, study. Uh, I'm hoping for this study to win uh, the first place just for, um, or, or just to show uh, that uh, good work like this was done in this very first place 
by the Libyan International Medical University, and it should go um, all over the world. Uh, that's it for today, and thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Faq Hussein. Today I'll be presenting my, my work regarding our scientific day in the Faculty of Business Administration in the Libyan, University, Libyan International Medical University. My topic is going to be about the determinants of Libyan buying, buyer behavior during the curfew. My instructor was Dr. Esdin Busnina, and I'll be starting right now with my introduction. So the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown and social distancing mandates have disturbed consumers having habits of buying as well as shopping. Consumers learned a new improvised and learning their habits. For example, consumers cannot go to the stores, so the stores has to come to, the, has to, come to them or has to come home. While consumers go back to old habits, it is likely that they will have be modified by new regulations and procedures in the ways in ways consumers uh, shop and buy products and services. New habits will also emerge by the technology advances, of course, changing demographics and innovative ways consumers have learned to cope with blurring their work, leisure, and education boundaries. Those are the effects of the consumer of of COVID nineteen on consumers' behavior. So first of all, we have in the beginning of the curfew and the total lockdown, there was a notice increase in the spending of groceries, food items, and hygiene products. People, people were actually all the time going to, uh, to groceries, uh, to grocery shops, buying a huge amount of, uh, huge amount of uh, food items, hygiene products, and everything. They were in confused state of mind as well. Second of all, there was a massive decrease in consumer spending uh, on restaurants, cafes, and sport activities due to the fact that those and the mentioned above uh, uh, businesses were actually closed. Third of all, uh, during the COVID-19 curfew, a rise in consumers' concerns had to lead to change around the most basic needs, sending demand more for hygiene and, and cleaning products. During the pandemic, people are spending less of their income on items perceived as nice to have or non-essential, such as cloth, clothing, shoes, makeups, electronics, games, and technologies as well. So here we have categories affected by the curfew. On my left here, the categories got increased, such as the online education or online, online working, uh, internet services, healthcare and pharmaceutical products, and groceries. Those categories here got actually increased. On the other hand, the categories got decreased here, which are restaurants, cosmetics, cars, vacation travels, decor and furniture, clothing, and many more. The surveys I had I had actually following data is actually collected from surveys which I made. Uh, those that data was distributed uh, online uh, through social media and emails, and that survey actually focused on the following factors, which are uh, products were bought during the curfew, usage of internet during the curfew, and the increase of online activity during the curfew, and personal concern about COVID nineteen. So the first question in the data was uh, in the survey. Sorry, what uh, actually was. Uh, what are the most products that you have bought uh, during the curfew? So here we have the numbers as well, which are groceries or food, uh, 62%, cleaning products, 36%, hygiene products, on the other hand, got 78%, personal care, 24%, internet services such as recharging cars, 70%, cosmetics, clothes, clothes and clothing or um, electronics technology uh, weren't actually in much of demand as well. Second of all, uh, we have the help of uh, during uh, help of internet during the curfew. Eighty-seven point five percent answered with yes. Third of all, which is extremely important here, is, is, that's an extremely uh, important data here. Uh, the following users increased. Which of the following users increased since COVID nineteen outbreak started? So the using of uh, using social media got eighty-seven percent. Watching live programming, uh, live programming got eighteen uh, percent. Learning or practicing new habits, twenty uh, percent. Watching movies or a series online, fifty percent. And many other games, uh, many other activities such playing games on mobile uh, devices or tabs, uh, playing games on computer as well, or reading books and magazines as well. The fourth sector of the surveys was uh, was talking about the factors concerning the consumers. Uh, regarding COVID-19. So here the inability to see friends or family uh, was 11.3%, impact on economy was 17%, uh, and the others, the, here are the factors that people were actually concerned about. Most of them were actually, 
very, very dangerous as uh, it tells you an indication about the consumers and how do they actually think, such as the impact on my job or security or uh, schools are being closed uh, during the pandemic. These are the scores and the, uh, the surveys. As we go here, this is the data analysis. This is the number, uh, the third section of the data analysis was which is uh, extremely important. So the third section of the survey is concentrated on the media consumption. A great number of consumers, which is 87.5% have increased their usages of social media and half of consumers, 50% have increased their consumption of watching series or films online since the pandemic started. So the consumption of playing games or mobile devices and tables showed a great number or great increases as well. But even non-digital media types like magazines and newspapers are seeing uh, an increase in usages. While consumers may not be out and physically, uh, there are still numerous opportunities for brands and retailers to connect with them through various media types. Those are the results and discussions. Uh, in mid-March 2020, lockdown was declared by the government and suddenly changes, uh, changes occurred in the consumer behavior. After declaration of the first lockdown of shop, all shops of essential commodities, were crowded with consumers. It became difficult for the shopkeeper to manage a huge crowd, um, crowded with, with, with consumers, sorry. It became difficult to shopkeepers to manage a huge crowd who came to purchase essential goods. And as well, uh, as, well as rumors were uh, widely spreading through the social media, nobody actually tried to, uh, uh, to say that's true, that's not. So rumors were everywhere, nobody, uh, Nobody actually had, the, had a way to filter such, a, such an information for us. Consumers were in folk in confused state of mind as well due to the shortage of goods in markets such as facial masks and many more. Governments on the other hand arranged more attention to fight against uh, COVID-19 such as uh, instructions and restrictions and regulations for entering, purchase, uh, entering the market and uh, trying, to essential, trying to purchase essential and goods. So the findings here, uh, number one, from the present research it was observed that social distancing, of course, is one of the safeguards against COVID-19. Uh, number two is during the research it was found that in the, lockdown, in the lockdown period, consumers' behavior was highly, was highly actually uh, susceptible. Number three is from the study, it was found that different factors were affecting consumers' buying behavior and lockdown situation as well. And it was also uh, found that the government has attempted to build wider communication bridges to create uh, awareness among the consumers. On the other hand, I have my personal recommendations, which are there should be an online awareness for the transaction habits among the consumers to avoid the effect of uh, COVID-19 all of the time. It doesn't, the government has to do this as a refreshment all the time during, the, during either the pandemic or during the uh, lockdown or anything. It has to be there as information for the government to, uh, to educate us or to get, educate the whole, um, call it people, call it a consumer, anything. But this is a, a this is a serious matter here, which uh, which people needs to be actually more educated with. So using uh, using social media, using uh, media channels, using TV, using radio, it should be actually more and more usages of that to be educate to be educated, uh, and sending messages to fight uh, COVID nineteen. On the other hand, it is recommended from, the, from this research study that uh, after COVID-19 numerous effect on consumers' behavior and the noted increase in the time spent online, in social media, to, uh, being online or on social media, which uh, as we remember, it was 87.5% most of the people were spending their time during the uh, lockdown uh, using their social media. Companies should try to appear and exist more online as it is the next uh, environment for, for the businesses to come or for the businesses to boom. Uh, I can remember that uh, I was reading an article and it was, it was saying that Zara company has uh, shut down 50% of their physical stores uh, around the world globally and they were shifting their focus more of online. Uh, that's after the pandemic and this after the, the first lockdown actually. So the conclusion is that COVID-19 forced shops around the world to shut for months and recently reopened under uh, strict and new guidelines of course. The time in lockdown has caused an e-commerce uh, e boom. With the pandemic accelerating the sh that shift away from uh, physical stores, e-commerce is expected to grow by nearly 20% in 2020, according to new data from IBM. As the COVID-19 uh, pandemic reshapes our world, more consumers have begun to uh, begun shopping online in greater numbers and frequency. Brands that created solutions 
uh, against COVID-19 to carry on its work showed a significant increase in its reputation, brand value, and brand, am brand image. For example, universities which use Google Meeting or Google Classrooms or universities who already had their own digital platforms had shown a great, uh, a great reputation and great increase in their, in their uh, names or brand names, such as our university as well. So customers are trying their best to adapt to strange times without a lot of footholds in shifting their behavior as a result. On the other hand, businesses are facing much of the same uncertainty, which, uh, sorry, while trying to support their customers' wants or needs or their own. E-commerce could be the next zone for lots of firms to be on the race for business world. Those are my references here, and I would like to thank you all, and I would like to give a special thanks actually to all universities for uh, sharing such uh, an opportunity with us. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, it's Suhail Firjani, dental intern at Limo. Fourth month ago, I was in a conversation with a medical colleague about how the dental students at the faculty are dealing with the pandemic of COVID-19. So I decided to start this research which talk about Libyan undergraduate dental student knowledge, perception and attitude to COVID-19 and infection control practice. Pandemic of COVID-19 has led to global crisis. The rapid surge of COVID-19 disease has not only raised the widespread of public health concern, but has collapsed the world economy. It has brought immense strain on social stability and global health system, particularly challenging the healthcare workers, including dental care professionals. It is therefore critical that prudent information should be relied to healthcare professionals in the time of this global crisis. This study investigated the knowledge and attitude of dental faculty toward the COVID-19 disease. It's a cross-sectional study that was conducted on the faculty at LEMO from the period of 15 August to 6 November of, 22, uh, of 2020. Sorry. An online survey questionnaire uh, an online survey questionnaire was administered through an electronic mail to the fac to faculty member. All the interns and undergraduate students were briefed about the context and purpose of this research. Uh, this study, uh, the study instrument, was divided into three parts. The first section of the survey constituted of demographic questions inquiring about the gender designation. The second included 13 research questions pertaining the participant knowledge regarding the COVID-19 disease, where yes or no options were provided for each question. The third part of the survey used a uh, question to uh, ascertain, uh, the, ascertain the attitude of the faculty member to where the COVID-19 disease on a five-point Likert scale that was devolved with balanced response and a neutral midpoint. The study tool assists the awareness of the faculty by probing about the mood of transmission, prevention, treatment, and management of patient in dental setting. The score of knowledge assessment range from zero to 13, the cutoff point about uh, less than or more than nine. Uh, insufficient knowledge and greater than or equal to nine for uh, sufficient knowledge. Attitude assessment was conducted and responses were documented on five-point Likert scale. About the results, the overall mean knowledge score of the, particip uh, of the participants was nine plus or minus 2.13. Sufficient knowledge was exhibited by 75.2 percent of the respondents, whereas 24.8 displayed insufficient knowledge. The study participants show excellent knowledge for the stems, for the stem that inquired about the mood of transmission, urgent dental care procedures, significance of protect, personal protective equipment, while the patient procedure, uh, while examination, use of high volume section and WHO guidelines regarding oral hand hygiene. Uh, on the other hand, the knowledge was good to fair for the questions regarding the rubber dam isolation uses of mm, N20 
on 95 masks for hand and dentistry extraction protocol, antibiotic use, and uh, screening. Uh, lastly, inadequate knowledge was evident in reaction of two questions. One, regarding safety of use of ultrasonic in COVID-19 suspected patients, and other was related to efficacy of or one percent of hydrogen peroxide mouthwash as a preference. The mean attitude score was in a range of 3.07 plus minus 0.13. Overall, faculty showed positive attitude when asked about fear of getting infected with COVID-19, treating all the emergency cases, seeking patients' relevant, med relevant medical history, asking about recent travel, checking body temperature, and avoiding procedure that calls aerosol protection. Conversely, the most negative attitude was noted when the faculty was asked if they would like to volunteer their service and support a medical team in case of a future emergency. All the results showed no significant correlation of gender uh, with both knowledge and attitude. The key result of the presented study, sorry, of the presented study may be used to create awareness on designing efficient infection control measures of COVID-19. But our limitation was the lower than expected response rate of the faculty and short period of data collection has led to comparatively smaller sample size. This pandemic has affected every aspect of life and caused many to be busy in making personal, official, and financial arrangements. This could have been resulted in selection bias and sampling error, which may limit the ability of to generalize our study. Future studies are required in this context. Fortunately, Lemo dentists were mindful of COVID-19 symptoms, mean of transmission, cross-infection control, and operative protocols practiced within the dental clinic. However, dentists exhibited inadequate knowledge about the sepsis, dentist, sepsis dental procedure that safeguard the dental staff and patient from COVID-19 in context of the current outbreak. Our reference are linked to this hyperlink if you are interested in them, so you can, uh, this poster are going to be printed out and you can have a look on it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like to see you in other, other scientific, uh, other scientific uh, meetings. Thank you. Hello everyone. I would like to introduce myself. Fatma Mansour, Busafita fifth year PharmD student, with my colleague Sana Duniz and supervisor Dr. Hanin Hussein. Our poster today under title, Weight Reduction Induced by Metformin is high, higher among diabetic patients than non-diabetic patients. Metformin is one of the most widely used medications in treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Since it is approval in the UK, in 1958 and in the USA in 1995, with doses ranging from 500 to 2,500 milligram per day. It's the first line therapy for patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus, according to American Diabetes Association, European Association for a Study of Diabetes Guidelines. Only one randomized controlled trial of high quality diabetes prevention program has been showed the metformin had significantly reduced weight in non-diabetic patients. Aim of a study, to compare the mean of weight reduction induced by metformin between diabetic and non-diabetic patients in Benghazi. Methods, questionnaire were distributed and filled by diabetic patients at diabetic center at the same time, the same questionnaire were distributed and filled by nutritionists at Adama Clinic in Benghazi City. Study period from January to March 2020. Total of 58 patients were included in the study, 32 women and 28, 26 men. 
Well, extracted questionnaire was distributed in Arabic language because all the patients were native Arabic speaker. Now, continue with my colleague Sadunis. Hello, everyone. I am Sanad Labedi, fifth year of PharmD. I will going to talk about statistic, result, and discussion, and limitation of our poster. Statistic data was collecting and analyzed by using SPSS statistics software. The result and discussion. In this table, patient age, most of the patients in this sample are over than 50 years with a 69%. Uses of metformin. While less than a month and one to three months were 6.9%. Equally from non-diabetic patients. Uh, weight reduction, diabetic and non-diabetic patient. The result showing that 50% from the patient lost from one to five kilograms, while a 24% patient say that they did not lose any from their weight. About 50.5% say their weight increases since they use metformin. In this table, we see weight reduction among diabetic patients, most significant decrease from one to five kilograms. Some of patients say their weight did not change with a percent 25.5. However, some patients gained weight with the metformin uses about 17.6 percentage. In this table, weight reduction among non-diabetic patients take into consideration that non-diabetic patients use metformin up to three months. About diet with a metformin regime in this diagram, we ask the patient if they use any diet regime. About 26% say yes, while 74% say no. About the question, with, when did you start in the diet regime? About 25% of, the, of them started diet with metformin. about suffer from disease who were using, did not suffer from any disease, while two of them had polycystic ovarian syndrome. The limitation of our poster, difficulty in collecting data and waiting patient before and after the use of metformin. Difficulty in finding nutritionist who use metformin, the prescription for patient who want to decrease body weight. And the, finally, the number of non-diabetic patients. Future work, we need more sample from Adama Clinic and we need sample from non-diabetic man patients. So at the end, we should thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Lubna Lushani. I'm a student in the Faculty of Business Administration, Limo, and today I will be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the banking sector. So as we all know, COVID-19's first emergence or appearance was in Wuhan, specifically in December of 2019. It is a global pandemic that spread worldwide and across all countries. It affected a lot of organizations and industries. Uh, negatively and positively. However, today we'll be talking about the results we found uh, and how COVID-19 impacted specifically the banking sector. So COVID-19 actually impacted the financial, uh, financial markets or the financial system due to its enormous economic costs. However, it did affect it also in positive ways. Um, but this is depending on whether the country was a developed or, an, an, uh, or a still developing country. So the data was collected from analyzing and um, reading previous articles and similar articles on the topic or on a related topic and also as well as 
conducting research and analyzing the data set of BMSCI, which is a, a financial organization and a global provider of stock prices, bonds, and other financial data. So uh, we're going to talk about how the COVID-19 impacted uh, countries and the banking sector positively and negatively. So first, we're going to talk about Libya and how it affected our banking system. And it did affect it in a negative way uh, because customers or civilians were not able to use the services that the bank provided due to the uh, COVID-19 and the quarantine we were in and the lack of the online banking system. So customers were not able to actually use the services that the bank provides. However, if you look at America, a developed country, there was also uh, there was already a online banking system, so customers did manage to um, to do their errands and to benefit from the uh, benefit from the service that the bank provides. They were able to, for example, take loans online or purchase their stuff uh, via Visa card or credit card on online stores. Uh, if we look at Europe, for example, they also managed to go through the crisis or like some countries uh, in Europe managed to go through that crisis and their banking system was not that affected due to um, as well providing an online banking system that customers could use where there was no human interaction needed. However, in a negative way, um, however, in a negative way, this impacted the employees that work in banks as there was a high rate of unemployment due to uh, employees losing their jobs because there was already an online banking system and civilians stopped actually going directly to banks to, um, to use the services provided. Uh, there was also a reduction in the organization's or the bank's value. As we said, uh, customers stopped going directly to the bank to use its services, so everything was um, so everything was conducted online. There was no act. There was an, an, not an actual value for the bank anymore because everything was uh, to be online via apps or online stores and credit cards. There was um, no need for the. There was no need for uh, for the bank to be an intermediary for those. So, as a conclusion, uh, the pandemic did affect um, did affect the banking sector or the financial systems globally in a negative way. However, there are also some positive ways it did affect the banking sector. In, uh, for example, like it did help. Um, it did help people to develop its technology and provide other ways. There were. Um, there were a lot of um, other ways for the civilians to conduct their businesses and it did not just stop on the banking sector. However, they did find an alternative way, which is the online banking system. And in fact, this is my recommendation for here uh, in Libya. We need to have an online banking system for us to conduct our businesses and day to day activities instead of actually having to go to the bank just to um, just to use the services. Uh, this is an uh, actual um, less costly way for the bank and the customers. It, of, um, it doesn't take as much time, it doesn't take as much cost. Uh, for example, the transportation to go there. Um, it's less costly in terms of actually uh, having to um, having to spend a lot of time in the bank waiting on the queues and it is also a very safe way and it uh, lessens the, the risk of getting infected as we don't need a face-to-face -face or a human interaction a direct human interaction and thank you for listening السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته أنا خيرية شكري طرابلسي متخرجة من قسم هندسة برمجيات بكلية تكنولوجيا المعلومات في الجامعة الليبية الدولية أول شيء حابة نعبر عن سعادتي بمشاركتي وكوني جزء من اليوم هذا اليوم العلمي وحابة نشكر الجامعة على أنشطتها المختلفة والمميزة مشاركتي اليوم حتكون بمشروع تخرجي ألا وهو إيثار إيثار موقع إلكتروني خيري يختص بالأعمال الخيرية وكان بإشراف الدكتور بلال الجبور واللي حابة نشكره واجد إنه هو كان المساعد الأول في هذا المشروع 
محتويات البرزنتيشن اول حاجه حيكون في انتروداكشن بسيط للفكره ثاني حاجه ننتقل لمرحله ريكويرمنتس هنا حيتم تحديد الوظائف الاساسيه اللي حيقوم بها البرنامج الموقع آه، ثالث حاجة حيكون في مرحلة الديزاين هي نحن نديرو بلو برنت أو خريطة عامة آه، نتبعوها لتنفيذ الشغل آه، المرحلة الرابعة هي التنفيذ ومرحلة أن نحن ننقل كل شيء آه، من ك... من كونسبت إلى شيء آه، برمجي وحقيقي واقعي آه، بعدها المرحلة الخامسة اللي هي التستينج الانترودكشن آه زي ما نشوف التطور الملحوظ في الأونلاين شوبينج وكيف قاعد جزء من حياتنا اليومية وفكرة أن اليوم أي شخص قاعد عنده أكسس للإنترنت بكل سهولة ويقدر يشي أي شيء من أي مكان الريفولوشن اللي صايرة آه في آه عالم الويب أبليكيشن والموبايل أبليكيشنز ولدت فكرة أن ليش ما الأونلاين شوبينج يكون عنده هدف أسمى وأعمق من مجرد أنك أنت تشي شيء وخلاص جت فكرة ليش ما نديرو موقع نتسوقو منه ونعرضو حاجات للبيع مثلا أنا نكون حاجة أنا مش محتاجتها ومع ذلك أنا ندير في عمل خيري ونساعد في الناس المحتاجة بالنسبة للبروبلم ستيتمنت آه في آه مشاكل آه ساعدا بتمسك بفكرة اللي نحنا قلناها فكرة المشروع هذه وإن نحنا ننفذه ونسعى إن نحنا يصبح حقيقة ويقعد موقع بزار خيري آه الفكرة الأساسية هنا إن نحنا شفنا إن في سوشيال جاب ما بين آه وما فيش تواصل فعال أو مباشر بين الناس اللي حابة تدير عمل خير وبين الناس اللي تشتغل في المجال هذا سواء كانت من منظمات أو أشخاص ومشكلة صعوبة عملية التبرع بحد ذاتها الحل أن نحن ندير منصة أو بلاتفورم على شكل ويب أبليكيشن هدفه أنه هو يحقق التكافل الاجتماعي لأنه حيشجع الناس أنها هي تعرض حاجات للبيع يستفيد منها ناس ثانية وفي نفس الوقت الريع بتاعها الفلوس تمشي للناس المحتاجة وبالمرة يكون موقع خيري متكامل يساعد على جمع تبرعات مثلا زي في المواسم المهمة زي رمضان وإذا كان في مثلا موسم شراء ملابس العيد أو ملابس الشتاء الايم والابجكتيف بتاع المشروع الهدف الاساسي من ناحيه تقنيه ان نحن نبون نديروا سوفت وير برودكت يكون كواليتي عالي يكون يوزر فريندلي وفي نفس الوقت الويب ابلكيشن يكون ويب ابلكيشن مختص بالعمل الخيري كيف نحقق الايم هذا عن طريق عده ابجكتيفز منها ان نحن نديروا انشيت للبروجكت نديروا له دراسه ثم نديروا نطبقوا او ننفذوا الشغل عن طريق ان نحن نديروا مودلز وكود بعدها في الاخير حنديروا فيريفيكيشن ان نحن كل شيء تمام معنا وكل شيء يطابق الواقع بالنسبه للفيزيبيليتي ستدي الفيزيبيليتي ستدي هدف منها ان نحن نعرف هل يمكن تنفيذ المشروع يلاقي اعجاب الناس وتفاعل من الناس او لا تم اجراء احصائيه لعين عشوائيه من المجتمع الليبي والاصاحيه والاحصائيه كانت اونلاين اونلاين سيرفي لضمان وصولها لاكبر عدد ممكن من الناس ولشرائح عمريه مختلفه الهد السؤال الاساسي اللي كان في السيرفي ان هل فكره أن يكون في موقع إلكتروني خيري هل فكرة تحسها أن هي عملية وهل تشوف في روحك في يوم من الأيام تكون يوزر لموقع زي هكي الريسبونس كانت 98% من الريسبونس نعم اليوزرز أو الناس متقبلة فكرة زي هذه وحابين أن هم يكونوا انفولف انت ف كان النتيجة إيجابية وخلتنا أن نبدو في تنفيذ المشروع بالنسبة لي مرحلة ال requirements ال requirements تم جمعهن أو استنباطهن على بثلاث طرق أول طريقة هي ال brainstorming كانت مع المشرف لتخطيط ان شنو الحاجات اللي نحن حنديرون حيكون مناسبات لمشروع زي هيك شنو الوظائف اللي حيكون من ناحيه تقنيه ومن ناحيه سوفت وير انه حيكون شيء ممتاز بالنسبه للاوبزرفيشنز طريقه كانت ان انا مشيت ل تم الحضور بازار خيري تم تنظيمه من قبل جمعيه ايادينا للتكافل الاجتماعي البازار شفت البروسس 
جمع تبرعات آلية بيع المنتجات وشنو المنتجات اللي تناسب مع الناس ويمكن يشروها وفكرة أن المنتج فلوسه حيمشى لجهة خيرية الإقبال عليه أكبر آه، الانترفيوز كان برضو مع جمعية أيدينا وتم الحصول منهم على معلومات في مجال الخيري والمجال الجمع تبرعات كيف أن هم آه الحاجات اللي هم ممكن المعلومات اللي ساعدنا في بناء موقع زي هيك بعد ما تم تحليل المتطلبات بعدة طرق زي اليوز كيس ديجرام واليوز كيس تيبلز تم استنباط مجموعة من الفانكشن والنون فانكشن ريكوايرمنتس الفانكشن ريكوايرمنتس هن الوظائف الأساسية اللي حيقوم بيهن الويب ابلكيشنز حاجات مش حنقدر نستغنوا عليهن ولازم يكون في التنفيذ موجودات مثلا مثال على هيك ان اليوزر يقدر يدير لوج ان للسيستم عن طريق يدخل الايميل والباسورد بتاعه واللوج ان انفورميشن هذه حتكون مسجله في الداتابيز النون فانكشن ريكوايرمنتس هن الوضع الريكوايرمنتس اللي حيعطن كواليتي للسيستم وحيميزنا للسيستمز الثانيات مثال على هيك ان اليوزابيلتي بتاع الموقع حيكون سهل بسيط مش محتاج اي دوره او اي حد او صعوبه في استعماله اليوزر حيلقى روحه انه هو حاب انه هو يستعمل الويب ابلكيشن بالنسبه للبروسيس موديل المستخدم البروسيس موديلز المستخدم في هذا المشروع هو الانكريمنتال موديل انكريمنتال موديل هي مثل لتطوير سوفتوير ابلكيشن بحيث ان السوفتوير يصمم وينفذ ويتم اختباره انكريمنتلي يعني بطريقه تزايديه لغايه ما يطلع عندنا البرودكت النهائي اللي هو وركن سوفتوير فوائدها ان ان يبان علينا موقع الكتروني او وركينج سيستم يشتغل من المراحل الاولى في التنفيذ ونضمن ان الاخطاء اقل وما يصيرش صدمه ان بعد ما نكمل الشغل يطلع مش زي ما هو متوقع كيف ما نوضح في البرزنتيشن هذا الدايجرام تاع الانكريمنتال موديل في عمليه الانشيشن والريكويرمنت الستيشن بعدين ان احنا نقسم الريكويرمنتس بناء على البريورتايز البريورتايزيشن تاعهم بعدين حيتم عمليه الاتيريشن او الانكريمنتال من مرحله الديزاين الى مرحله التستنج لغايه ما يطلع لنا فاينل برودكت بالنسبة للريليس بلان كان تقسيم ال ال requirements على ثلاث increments أول increment كانت مختصة بحاجات أساسية في الموقع إن كيف أنا ندير accounts لليوزرز وللأدمن ثاني increment هي إن نحنا functions ثانيات زي إن ال اليوزر يقدر يحط items والأدمن يقدر يقبلهم ثالث increment هي إن نحنا توجي عملية الشراء كيف شنو البروسيجرز المعينات اللي حيصيرن في العملية هذه وفي الأخير حيطلع عندنا فاينل برودكت وهو سوفتوير كامل نجو لمرحلة الديزاين واللي هي المرحلة ال اللي كل تم فهم المتطلبات وحيتم ترجمتهم إلى بلانز وأركتكترال ديزاينز عشان نزيد نفهم السيستم ونقربوه عشان يكون فينا عندنا كومبوننتس عشان نبدو التنفيذ بالنسبه لاي اي بروسس في لها انبوتس وفي لها اوتبوتس الانبوتس لمرحله الديزاين هن ريكويرمنت سبيسيفيكيشنز وحنديروا عليهم اكتيفيتيز وبعدين حيطلع عندنا الاوتبوتس اللي هن حيطلع عندنا ابلكيشن سبيسيفيكيشن انترفيس او يوزر انترفيس سبيسيفيكيشن وداتا بيس سبيسيفيكيشن في عدة طرق لتحليل أو ديزاين أن أركتكتشول ديزاين منها الأكتيفيتي تايجرام هنا واضح الأكتيفيتي تايجرام ميزة أنه هو يوضح اليوزر أول ما يدخل على السيستم شنو الوظائف اللي هو حيديرهن الكلاس دايجرام يوضح طريقة الديتا شنو أنواع الديتا اللي حتكون موجودة عندي في السيستم تاعي وشن كيف حتكون تقسيمها وشن الميثودز اللي حيت اللي حتدير بروسس على الداتا هذه السيكونس دايجرام سيكونس دايجرام يوضح كل أكتر وشن حيقوم من وظائف وشن التسلسل الزمني لهذه الوظائف بالنسبة نجو لمرحلة اليوزر انترفيس ديزاين هي المرحلة المحببة لقلبي بصراحة المرحلة هنا حي حندير بروتوتايب يوضح لنا شنو الشكل اللي حيكون للابلكيشن خير ما احنا نبدو كودينج وبعدين نصدموا ان مش هذين الالوان اللي احنا نبوهن مش هو النمط اللي احنا نبوه 
الابلكيشن بتاعنا آه تم اختيار هوية لإيثار عشان يكون مميز و... وله آه user experience خاصة به آه بعدين آه هذينا مثال على user interfaces زي الهوم بيج واضح فيها ان الالوان مريحات آه جميلة آه متناسقات في آه في هدوء للعين عشان لما تشوفها تحب ان اليوزر يحب انه يستخدمه هذه اللوج ان بيج في صفحة ثانية هنا توضح طريقة عرض الايتمز ننتقل الى الديزاين باترن ديزاين باترن هو تمبلت او ديسكريبشن نتبعه عشان عشان ننفذه سوفت وير ونخلو وفكرة ان انت تخلي الكود يتبع باترن معين يكون مفهوم اكثر واسهل في تعديله وصيانته الانفسي باترن يقسم الابليكيشن الى ثلاثة الموديل والفيو والكنترولرز طبعا الام في سي تستعملها عدة من التقنيات زي الـ PHP والـ Python C Sharp والـ Java كلهم يشتغلوا ويعتمدوا على Architecture of MVC نشرح شوية على الـ MVC الموديل هو جزء المتعلق بالـ Database يتعامل مع الـ Data الـ View هي عبارة عن الـ Visualization للـ Data هذه اللي حتبان على الـ User والـ Controller هو الوسيط ما بين الاثنين الـ MVC هي وحدة واحدة من فوائد أن يتوفر الـ Low Coupling والـ High Cohesion هو concept معروف في الـ Software Engineering وأي Software System يطمح أنه هو يكون uh, has a Low Coupling Code and a High Cohesion نجيو إلى الإطار العمل اللي تم استخدامه في هذا المشروع هو لارافل لارافل هو open source free framework لبناء وتطوير الويب applications يعتمد اعتماد كلي على ال MVC architecture أو ال MVC pattern في آلية شغله ال framework يخلي ال implementation أسهل وفي ميزة ثانية زي ال authentication والسكيورتي في عالي لأنه يستخدم في تقنية تمنع ال CSRF أو هي ال Cross Site Request Frequency وهي تمنع أي أتاك إنه هو يوصل للسيرفر لأن هي تمنع الأتاك من من ناحية ال Client في نفس الوقت Laravel يوفر ال Migrations وال Blading وهن حاجات مميزات ويخلى ال Implementation سهل ال Blading يدير في سباجيتي ما بين ال HTML وال BIP والبي اتش بي بطريقة سهلة ومنظمة ننتقل إلى مرحلة الامبلمنتيشن الامبلمنتيشن هنا المرحلة أن احنا حنترجم كل شيء إلى كود ونبدو نشوفه في الريزولت آه التكنولوجيز المستخدمات في بناء هذا المشروع آه بالنسبة للفرونت اند كان اتش تي ام ال طبعا جافا سكريبت سي اس اس وبوت ستراب اللغة لغة البرمجة كان بي اتش بي الويب ستورم هو كان التكست اديتور لهذا المشروع اللارجون هو كان الجي او اي ابلكيشن يشغل اللارفل وهو يوفر ايزوليتد انفايرمنت للشغل ماي سكيول هي كانت الداتابيز المعتمدة نجو كيف ما قلنا ان لارفل يطبق في الديزاين باترن ففي الموديل واضح ان احنا نتعامل مع الديتا كيف حتكون شكلها وشنو كيف هي تتعلق بالديتا الثانيات المايجريشنز هنا حاجه تستخدم في لارفل تنقل الديتا او تنقل الديتا من الداتابيز ولا الى الداتابيز الكنترولرز هن الوسيط ما بين قلنا الفيو والكنترولر ففيها اغلب اللوجيك الراوتس هي شيء ايضا في الكنترولرز يعرض يرتب كل شيء حينعرض على الفيو الفيوز هن البي اتش بي فايلز اللي فيهن جو الاتش تي ام ال والسي اس اس بعدين حننتقلوا على الكان شارت لمرحلة الامبلمنتيشن طبعا بما ان قسمنا المشروع على انكرمنتس فكان لازم ان نحنا يكون في خطة زمنية كل انكرمنت تم الحمد لله تسليمها في وقتها وكل وتم حساب وقت لان نحنا نديرو يونت تستنج لكل انكرمنت ثم انتجريشن تستنج لكل انكرمنت وما قبلها نقول مرحلة التستنج مرحلة التستنج هي مرحلة إن إحنا نبون نتأكدوا إن كل شيء يشتغل زي ما إحنا 
متفقين عليه آه في عدة آه methods ان نحن نديرو testing زي ال test cases وال test matrix test case هي مثلا احنا حيكون فيها data زي هل شو النوع ال test اللي ندار هل هو black box testing او white box testing آه هل هو test to pass او هل هو test to fail آه شنو ال data اللي استخدمت في هذا ال test من دار ال test وتوثيق لل data لل data اللي تم فيه آه اجراء هذا ال test كا كونكلوجن آه بعد ما تم آه استخدام بروسس موديل واعتماد ديزاين باترن آه طلع عندنا سوفتوير ابلكيشن وهو ايثار آه ايثار موقع آه خيري آه له هويه خاصه به آه له روح يعني فحنديروا شويه تور على الابلكيشن <تصفيق> فجر نزيح الظلام فكنا الضياء بشمس فتية وجئنا الطبيب لنمحو السقام فنحن بني الجامعة الدولية أتينا كفجر نزيح الظلام فكنا الضياء بشمس فتية وجئنا الطبيب لنمحو السقام فنحن بني الجامعة الدولية شبابا ونرفع راي العلوم ونخطو بها من يفوق الثريا شبابا ونرفع راي العلوم ونخطو بها من يفوق الثريا فنحن القدوم ليوم القدوم ونحن الأمام لليبيا الأبية Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Ahmed Abdullah Bani, a third year medical student at Faculty of Applied Medical Science, AMS, supervised by Dr. Muhammad Hamza and assisted by Dr. Suzanne Alhouni at the year of 2019-2020. So the objectives of this presentation, we need to know what is malignant hyperthermia, what is the etiopathogenesis and the course of the disease, uh, we need to know the clinical manifestation of the disease, how can we manage it. There's also a case study to put more emphasis and know better about the disease and how can we manage it better. And also, finally, there will be the conclusion. Now, starting off with the definition. What is malignant hyperthermia? Well, malignant hyperthermia is a rare but life-threatening disorder. It is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern a potentially lethal hypermetabolic syndrome that may lead to a metabolic crisis of skeletal muscle in susceptible individuals following exposure to triggering agents like volatile anesthetics, uh, such as halothane, inforlane, or depolarizing muscle relaxants, such as saxamethonium. In the course of excitation contraction coupling, acetylcholine evokes an action ability on the neuromuscular end plate. This action potential is propagated to the transverse tubule, inflicting displacement of the rate on the dehydropyridine receptor. A conformational change on the voltage-gated dehydropyridine receptor is directly transmitted to the rhinodine receptor subtype 1. At the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which responds by opening a big ion channel, it allows a launch of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol, leading to muscle contraction uh, by initiating cross-linking of the myofilaments. So active reuptake of calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum via an adenosine triphosphate-dependent calcium pump terminates the muscle contraction. 
This is in the physiological aspect. But in the pathological aspect, as in, ma ma as in uh, malignant hyperthermia crisis, the triggering agent induces an extended opening of the functionally altered ryanodine receptors. This results in an uncontrolled release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and an ongoing muscle activation presenting as rigidity. Uh, malignant hyperthermia has complications and they are very tough complications. The complications are as follows. There is a consistent activation of aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, which results in an expanded oxygen intake, leading to hypoxia, progressive lactic acidosis, and an excessive production of carbon dioxide. There is also an increase in body temperature and also calcium uptake into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and sustained muscle contraction consume large amounts of adenosine triphosphate. The depletion of the cellular adenosine triphosphate stores results in the protracted muscular rigidity and ultimately to rhabdomyosis. And there is also the breakdown of membrane integrity, which results in a release of the contents of the cells like potassium, creatine, phosphokinase, myoglobin into the circulation. This is as well as with uh, widespread critical organ dysfunction and also disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Now we're going to the management of malignant hyperthermia, the main focus on this uh, presentation. You see, the prognosis of a malignant hyperthermia crisis, it depends on how soon malignant hyperthermia is suspected and how rapidly appropriate treatment is initiated. Administration of triggering agents must be stopped immediately and anesthesia should be continued using intravenous opioids, sedatives, and uh, if necessary, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Treatment includes immediate administration of dentralin, about two milligram per kilogram, which should be repeated every five minutes until the cardiac and respiratory system are stabilized. Now I've been talking about dentralin as the main drug for the treatment. What is dentralin? You see, dentralin is a hydratonin uh, derivative. It acts as a specific rhinodine receptor antagonist and inhibits the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum without improving its reuptake. And the drug has a couple of side effects. The specific side effects are a bit rare, but it includes prolonged breathing problems, tissue necrosis after accidental extravasation, nausea, vomiting, headache, and also dizziness. Uh, patients experiencing, uh, experiencing a malignant hyperthermia should receive dantrolin and be monitored closely for about 48 to 72 hours. Since even despite dantrolin treatment, 25% of patients will experience a reoccurrence of this syndrome. Tests for disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, should be included as well as observation of urine for a myoglobinuric renal failure, uh, DIC is the most frequent when the uh, body temperature exceeds about 41 degrees Celsius. Uh, since masseter muscular rigidity, which is also called MMR, it may presage malignant hyperthermia. So patients should be admitted to an intensive care unit and be monitored for the signs of malignant hyperthermia. Rhabdomyolysis also occurs in virtually all patients experiencing uh, MMR and the creatine kinase values should be also checked regularly. Now I'm going to the uh, case study. Uh, there has been a case above a 20 year old male child. He had convulsions and high fever after a simple surgery, which is caused by the malignant hyperthermia. Uh, once confirmed, immediate measures were taken to lower the body temperature. The patient first was admitted to the hospital for hernial repair. Surgery was done under continuous epidural anesthesia and everything was going completely normal. The child was given five milliliter of 0.894% uh, of ripafacaine and 2% of lidocaine mixture. This is when the problem occurred, which I mentioned earlier. The patient had convulsions, high fever after just a simple surgery. Why? I don't like, we need to know why. The immediate measures were taken to lower the body temperature. Antidote adentralin was contacted at once and active cooling and application of the special effect antidote dentralin played a key role on the successful treatment of the child. 
this made the doctors like they knew the disease and how it, uh, the course of the disease and how can they like have a fast reaction to treat the patient and save them. Because malignant hyperthermia has a very high mortality rate if it has not been identified as soon as possible. So in conclusion, the management of malignant hyperthermia crucially depends on the understanding of the pathophysiology of the disorder and its clinical manifestation, as bad timing of initiation of treatment can lead to death. These are the references for my presentation, and thank you very much for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Nezal Kharaz and I work as a tutor at the Faculty of Business Administration at the Libyan International Medical University. Today and in this presentation, I'll be talking about the roles and responsibilities of a tutor. So let's get started. At the beginning, I'll define briefly who a tutor is and then I'll be talking about some of the main responsibilities that a tutor has. Tutors are generally expected to be advocates and supportive of the BPL concept. The BPL stands for problem-based learning. It's a self-directed approach of teaching and learning where students are given a problem, a trigger, and any of the subjects that we would like to teach them something about, say, for example, sales promotion, product, man, uh, product development, uh, marketing plans, or personal selling, or even HR management. So we will just, I'm sorry, give them a problem and students have to cooperate together through a number of stages and a series of procedures of reasoning and solving the problem to achieve certain designed learning and educational object objectives at the end of the process okay so in such a an operation tutorials are seen as forums for students to integrate information gain guidance and feedback and tutors are simply guides or facilitators of the process. So a tutor doesn't have to be content expert. All they have to do is to ensure that all of the students are taking part in the learning process and keeping the tutorial from going way out in left field. Now to some of the responsibilities that a tutor has. We as tutors must create a safe space where every student is heard, recognized and accepted and where students are comfortable enough to talk openly about their difficulties, to challenge one another, and most importantly, to admit when they don't know or when they don't understand. We must be familiar with the objectives of the current unit and the objectives of the course as a whole, as a guide to progressive learning and a backdrop for evaluation. Another responsibility we have is to promote learners' critical thinking by making sure that their knowledge is challenged and propped, by asking them non-directive stimulating questions to provoke their thinking. We must ensure that objective, rigorous, but evidence-based evaluation occurs in the unit. Another thing uh, we have to do is to promote efficient to group function by helping the group to set early goals and a plan which can be modified and by serving ourselves as a role model for productive ways of giving feedback. So we must be able to give students a constructive feedback so that students observe us and learn from us how to give a constructive feedback to one another. We must provide students you know, with, the, um, with the references and the resources needed to tackle a certain problem. And we must ensure that students are able to cite them appropriately, appropriately according to the different styles, APA, MLA, or Chicago style. Finally, because in a faculty like ours, we aim to prepare students not only to be expert in terms of the knowledge, like in, in terms of the content of what they learn, but also we would like to prepare them to be professional in their future careers, we have to promote their communicative skills such as those of giving presentations, communicating via email, communicating via memo, um, writing meeting minutes, writing resumes, and reviewing them. With the help of instructors and tutors, a profile of a PPL graduate should contain not only the knowledge, the ability to apply what they've learned, but also the skills, such as those of giving presentations, as I said, 
uh, teamwork, problem solving, and conducting lifelong learning. And also the attitude of upholding the ethics, values, and professionalism of their professional practice. Finally, and in conclusion, I would like to say that the roles and responsibilities of a, of a, of a tutor do vary from one, from one faculty to another, from one college to another, and from one university to another. However, I've chosen to concentrate on the, on the commonalities and the resources that I've consulted. I hope that you have enjoyed my presentation. Thank you very much for watching. And yeah, these are the references. And again, thank you very much. Bye-bye. scientific day in Leap International Medical University. Today I'm going to present you my poster which talks about how far we could get intervention without open surgery in cardiology with me Malak Lagore. So of course one of your family member, friend or even neighbor had a cardiac problem but he or she not candidated to invasive open surgery either have ischemic, valvular or even congenital heart disease. Thus, they need less invasive intervention with those devices that I'm going to talk about it. Those devices help to avoid the open surgery, decrease the morbidity, mortality, and not forget, decrease the hospital stay. Also, something I have to mention, that those devices are still some of them not used here in Libya as other country, but we have the old version of them. Also, some of them just recently take the FDA approved. So let's go through back in cardiology history. Warner Forsman in the 1929 did the first right heart catheterization on himself. The two who introduced the diagnostic uh, cardiac catheterization were Ender Cornard uh, and the Cancer Richard in the early 40s. Not to forget, Maison Sons in the early 60s described the selective coronary angiography. But the biggest jump was the catheter-based intervention in the late 70s by Andrew Ketterizing. So back to main subject of the poster today, I'm going to talk about five diseases and their devices, which are atrial septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, and mitral regurgitation. So let's start with the first one, atrial septal defect, or you could say ASD. So ASD. Uh, it's an opening varying in size and a place in the atrial septa. We have four types uh, secundum, premium, sinus, venosum, and coronary sinus. The first one, secundum, is the most common type and occurs in the middle of the wall between the atria. So uh, before was the treatment of ASD depend on the the hemodynamic and the morphological features. So the hemodynamic difficulty are severe pulmonary hypertension, ventricular dysfunction, and restrictive left ventricular complaint complaints after the ASD closure. And for the morphological one, there uh, if this was larger size, like more than thirty millimeter, wide rim deficiency, and multiple defect. But after the amplitizer septal occluder, let's see here, the first one, they could treat the ASD without open surgery, but not for the large size defect or multiple. But the ampli uh, amplitizer cropriform device and the core helix device, those two could be done for large size defect by placing more than device side by side also could be used for multiple defect which the first one couldn't do it if you see here i will zoom it for you the steps of uh with angiography and how it's look like even if you're not cardiologist you could see the darker area here and this is the defect area or the opening we see here this device the amplifier and how when we open the device and had a uh, narrow waist, we see how the dark area or the opening start to disappear. 
thus is very effective. So moving into the next one, which is the beta inductus arteriosus. The beta inductus arteriosus, uh, it's diagnosis um, in childhood, but they could delay the treatment to the adulthood, which will reflect a, a lot of complication. Before that was a problem, the fear of surgery, but now it is not an issue. Those three devices that you see here affect the same, affect the same, but the amplitizer Dr. Kluder had the high uh, success rate over 95% to treat the defect at six months. This one. The new one, which is the net occluded device, differ from other two devices there that the route of entry from the arterial side through the aorta. But all have the same uh, function. Moving into the next thing, which is the aortic stenosis. The aortic stenosis, which is uh, a degenerative progression, had a high mortality. Thus, who not qualify for surgery you must do a TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. We could see here uh, the four, uh, the four devices. Those four. The first one, which is Edward Spam 3, improve uh, the design of the catheter and the sheet, have resulted in the delivery profile of 14 French for the 23 to 26 millimeter valve and 60 French for 29 millimeter valve. Nothing, just something that have not forgot that they need vessel size about 5.5 millimeter and 6 millimeter. The next one which is uh, metatronic uh, curve valve which is indicate for severe aortic stenosis uh, with high risk for surgery and it's gained the curve valve in 2009 but they took the approve uh, of FDA in 2014. The next one, which is the portico valve, uh, is the shorter than the than the core valve, thus reduce the risk for conduction injury. Plus one which is the direct flow valve, which is a non-metallic made of bivin pericardium and expanded cuff. Also, it's atraumatic. It indicates for severe aortic stenosis and it's used in USA. But it didn't take the FDA approved in USA for the use of aortic regurgitation or performed by CASPIP before. Thus, it's only used for aortic stenosis. Moving into the next uh, mitral valve. The mitral valve had stenotic mitral valve and regurgitation and the mitral regurgitation. The first one, which is the mitral stenosis. So, the valve need only a new pillow. Valve will range from 24 millimeter to 30 millimeter in diameter. The amazing thing in this improvement, the mitral stenosis was only surgical option, but after 80s, it changed to be the uh, precutaneous intervention. Moving into the mitral regurgitation, uh, but not <laughs> sorry. Um, here you see the balloon and how it looks like an echo. The next thing, the mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation, uh, which is more common than the mitral stenosis. The two devices, those two, have been effective way better than the old devices. The first, which is the mitral clip. Uh, development system, the device enter uh, the mitral valve, open the clip, then pull it up, and thus reduce the regurgitation. The second one, which is Caroline a mitral counter system, um, they implant it uh, in the coronary sinus, thus middle ring around the mitral valve, thus the device, as you see, have a proximal and distal part and connected with anchor uh, and connected with uh, nitinol shape propin 
Um, in 2019, in a France conference, a uh, cardiology conference, they show a case of a female, a tw uh, 81 year old, had a severe motor regurgitation with dyspnea. After doing Caroline system device, the patient decreased the medication of heart failure, and the patient died after two years from cancer. So it's died from another cause rather than the um, the mitral regurgitation that that she had before so that's all thank you for your watching those are my reference if you have anything to ask just email me and thank for big thanks for my supervisor dr zakibal summer who helped me to improve my poster thank you all <laughs>
the transcription state will be a high and the transcription will happen. On the other hand, VB30 in its phosphorylated form, as we see in the red, uh, red color, it indicate weekly or non-transcription occur. So this is the result of the second study. About the result of the uh, third study, as I mentioned, it was looking for any interaction between the human proteins and specifically the RBBP6 peptide and the uh, Ebola virus protein. And yeah, they found out the result was positive. As we see here, the green one, it indicate our protein and the uh, red one indicate the virus protein. So it was the interaction between them was positive. Now going to the discussion, as I mentioned, three different study, three discussions. Uh, well, uh, according to the first study, which was focusing on the interaction of the, or the neutralization of the uh, viruses, they found out, as, as we mentioned in the result, the interaction between the uh, virus or between the antibodies and the um, antigens or Ebola virus antigen, specifically the glycoprotein that we mentioned in the structure, we mentioned, we said like the glycoprotein was helping the virus to get into the cell. So uh, they found out neutralization or antibodies inhibit or cover these glycoproteins. So that leads to inhibiting the entering of the virus. So uh, this, uh, this study uh, was according to research team from uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center and University of Texas Medical Branch 2018. The second study was according to a team from Human Virology Department, University de Lyon in France 2011. They found out, as I mentioned, the non-phosphorylated form of VB30 was um, the, trans the non phosphorylated form of uh, VB30 support the transcription, as we said, as we saw in the result. On the other hand, the VB30 in its, uh, in its phosphorylated form inhibit or uh, make the transcription weak or not occur at all. In some in some cases, it could not occur at all. Sorry. So according to the uh, uh, the third study. According to the new uh, Northwestern Medicine Study 2080, the research was collaboration between Georgia State University and the University of California, San Francisco. What they found out, as we mentioned, it, uh, the study was focusing and looking for any interaction between both the uh, human, uh, between the human virus, or protein, our protein, a human protein, and the protein of the virus. And according to uh, the study, they found out the interaction between specifically VB30 and RBBP6 has been found. And the study confirmed that the removing of the RBBP6 were, uh, will induce the, uh, the virus transcription. So three different studies as a conclusion, we can figure out. Purely clinical trials, everything makes sense that it, um, uh, or the different steps or different ways, all of them concentrate on inhibit, inhibiting the replication in such a way. So even though each study seems to be to be really successful, there's a still no cure up to now. And that's a probably uh, because the nature of the virus, uh, how uh, it's hard to study this virus. Um, plus um, all the clinical trials, they are giving, a, giving us hope that there will be cure and uh, will be cured in the future, inshallah. And this is uh, my references. Thank you for listening. السلام عليكم. اسمي مريم فركاش. طالبة في السمستر السابع لكلية تكنولوجيا معلومات. تخصصي هو سوفتوير إنجينيرين. والموضوع اللي حنتكلم عليه هو شيء الأغلبية يستخدموا فيه ويعتبر شيء مهم جدا اللي هو الكلاود كمبيوتينج. حنعطي عليه مقدمة سريعة وخلفية عنا مزايا وعيوب وبعض التحديات اللي واجهها الكلاود كمبيوتينج وحلولها. هذا المحتوى العام حبيت نوريه بالشكل الكامل وبعدها حنمشي فقرة فقرة ونشرح بالتفصيل كل شيء. Abstract Cloud Operating Systems is a lightweight operating system that stores data 
and can access web-based applications from uh, from a web uh, uh, remote server. This poster gives an overview of cloud computing, including security attacks and challenges that might be arrested against our personal information and their solutions as well. هو اوبريتنج سيستم يعتبر خفيف ويخزن البيانات ويوفر الفلوس ويوفر حتى الوقت ويوفر حتى الستورج وبالنسبه للبوستر هذا حيكون يعني محتوى عام على الحاجات اللي ذكرتها اوبريتنج سيستم از ذا موست امبورتنت سوفتوير ات وركس از ان انترفيس بين هاردوير اند يوزر Uh, هو يعتبر انترفيس ما بين اي جهاز يعني الهاردوير والمستخدم الوظائف او البيسك فانكشناليتيز اوف اوبريتنج سيستمز ار الوظائف الاساسيه متعدده واللي هنا ريسورس مانجمنت اللي هي اداره الموارد الموارد عندنا ممكن يكون معدات او ماتيريالز uh, يعني ان المانجر شنو يديروا في الريسورس مانجمنت ان المانجرز يقدروا ينظموا ويحزموا من الريسورت الريسورسز هنا عشان يضمنوا الافشنسي اللي هي الفعليه بتاع بتاع الاوبريتنج سيستم بروسيس سكادولينج هي آه وظيفه بتاع الاوبريتنج سيستم انا شنو يدير يدير جدوله للعمليات شنو هنا او مش عمليات هي بشكل واضح ستيتس زي شنو ريدي الويتنج اند رانينج الهدف الاساسي من بروسيس سكاجرينج انه يخلي السي بي يو شغال باستمرار ما فيش آه ما فيش آه فتره يمر فيها خمول هيك لازم يكون بيزي اول ذا تايم ايفنت هاندلينج هي ميكانيزم ذات كنترولز ان ايفنت اند ديسايدز وات شود هابن اف ان ايفنت اوكرز هي تحكم في الاحداث وتحدد امتى كل حدث ممكن يصير Uh, بالنسبة لل ما زلنا في الانترودكشن هي الاشيو اللي اللي تحت الدراسة اصلا قال قبل ما يجي حاجة اسمها كلاود قبل ما يطلعوا بالفكرة هذه كان في اشيوز الناس ما عرفوش كيف يتجنبوهن زي شنو ريكفرين باك اب اشيوز مثلا لو حاجاتك راحة معش نقدروا نردوهن يعني سكيورتي uh, اشيوز اكيد طبعا في كل شيء ديما السكيورتي uh, معضلة و transfer of data, uh, accessibility, power consumption and storage management. The uh, background, the idea of uh, cloud computing, بدأت في التطور uh, بدأت في التطور في منتصف الستينات اللي هي 1960s uh, اللي طلع ب, اللي طلع بالفكرة اللي هو American scientist named John McCarthy طلع بفكرة أن ال دار انظمه متجمعه من الكمبيوترز عشان نخلي سهل عمليه الاكسسبيليتي للفايلز والديتا سهلها للناس مصطلح كلاود اصلا جاي من تيلي كوميونيكيشنز وورد ان في شركات وفرا اللي هي خدمات الفي بي ان او الفيرتشوال برايفت نتورك وذ هايست كواليتي اوف سيرفيسز خدمات لهن جوده at much lower cost. منافع على cloud computing اللي هي cost saving بدل ما نشرو expensive systems اللي هن الأنظمة الغالية يعني نقدر نقلل ال cost هذنا أن نستخدم ال resources تاعت cloud computing بس. mobility employees اللي يشتغلوا في remote locations مثلا يشتغلوا في عن بعد يقدروا يوصلوا لكلاود سيرفيسز عادي بس اللي يحتاجوه شبكة انترنت Unlimited Storage Capacity اللي هي في كل وقت نقدروا نوسع الكباسيتي بتاعنا مثلا هم عطينا 5 جيجا نقدروا ندفعوا فيه يعني مبلغ رمزي يزيدوا لي المساحة باك اب نرستور داتا مثلا لو خسرنا ملفات نقدروا نديروا ريستور اه بالنسبة للرسمة هذه ان عملية الاكسسبيليتي قصيرة ممكن سيرف آه عن طريق سيرفر ونقدر نوفر الخدمة اللي هي ستورج ونوصلوا لها عن طريق موبايل والابلكيشن والديتا بيسز في برايفت وبابليك وهايبرد كلاود اللي هن البابليك كلاود تعتبر شيرد اكروس اورجنايزيشنز يقدر يوصلوا لها جميع المنظمات برايفت كلاود اونلي 
dedicated to your organization. بالنسبة للهايبريد تستخدم في الاثنين ما بين الببليك والبرايفت. Limitations uh, Network Connection Dependency الكلاود ما يشتغلش بدون انترنت. Uh, limited features uh, أنا لازم نشتغلوا ببروفايدر uh, لازم نشتغلوا عن طريق بروفايدر يوفر لنا الباندويث معينة ما تكونش يعني المساحة محدودة فهذا عليش يعني التكنيكال ايشيوز أن لو تصير مشكلة تقنية في الكلاود ما ندرش إلا نكلموا تكنيكال سبورت ما ندرش نصلحوها ات هوم يعني المشكلة تصير مش حتى تصلحيها ات هوم بيرفورمانس انستابيلتي اللي هي تصير أنا بسبب هاي لود على الكلاود ممكن يصير ضغط عالي يعني هذا من ال limitations security attacks اللي هي أهم نقطة ممكن إحنا نقدر نشرح عليها اللي هي جا في أنواع attacks يصير عن ال cloud اللي هن زي SQL injection malicious insider attack and denial of service attacks SQL injection هي تحطين للكود أو تكنيك يستخدم في الكود عن يعني كأسلوب SQL statements نكتبه SQL statements تستخدم لمهاجمة الابليكيشنز اللي هن داتا دريفن. المالشيس انسايدر اتاك اللي هو امبلوي مثلا يحول معلومات من الاورجنايزيشنز او يعني يتلاعب في المعلومات هذنا لمصلحته الشخصية او لغرض انه ممكن يدير دامج للاورجنايزيشن. دينايل اوف سيرفيس اتاك هي اتاك تخلي الريسورس الريسورسز ان افيلبل ان ما يخليهنش متاحات كيف؟ ان يدز ريكوست وهميات طلبات واجد وهميات يدير لود على السيرفر لين يطلع عن الخدمة عشان يقدر يدير اتاك براحته داتا سكيورتي تشالنجز اللي هي الكلام هذا معتمد على السلايد اللي بعده لازم نركزوا على قال لك على السكيورتي والبرايفسي ان في اكبر تشالنجز يقابلن ديما داتا سيجريكيشن اند بروتكشن داتا ليك بريفنشن ان مي تصريب بيانات ديما فيه مشاكل ديما يطلع بيانات وفي ديتا سيجريجيشن لان هذا تشالنجز كبار يعني باقي يعتبر يعتبر عاديات ابلكيشن سكيورتي افيلابيلتي اوف سيرفيسز اند داتا ان ذا كلاود داتا ليك بريفنشن ان ذا كلاود ايدنتيتي اند اكسس مانجمنت ثريت اند فولنبيلتي هذا كله يعتبر عاديات مقارنه بالديتا ليك بريفنشن اند داتا سيجريجيشن في ثلاث areas أو ثلاث نطاقات مهمة من security اللي هي confidentiality, integrity and availability. confidentiality keeping your data private. أنا لازم البيانات نحموها من أي نوع attacks. integrity يفضل أن على اليوزر ما يكتبش الباسورد المتعدد أو يخزن معلوماتها في يعني في جهاز عشان integrity نقدر نضمنها. Availability تعتمد على اتفاق ما بين الفندر باع أو هيكي and the clients. Segregation هذا من ال challenges. Segregation اللي هي شنو injecting a client code نحط كود باستخدام أي application. نجرب نحط الكود هذا ممكن يصير intrusion اللي هي تهاجم على بيانات. فمن الضروري عشان نخزنوا ال data separately from remaining customers data لازم يصير فصل بين البيانات اللي نخزنوها ممكن ال vulnerabilities اللي هنا التأثيرات اللي يصيرن في فصل البيانات هذنا باستخدام ال test زي data validation تأكيد البيانات نديرو عليه مراجعة باستمرار data locality in cloud computing the data is distributed over the number of regions and to find the location So data is difficult. اللي هي أنا لما لما بينات يقدر موزعات على عدة مناطق. أنا نجيب اللوكيشن متاع الداتا حيكون صعب. فالكاستمرز لازم يعرفوا اللوكيشنز متاعتهم وأي سيرفس سيرفس بروفايدر يقدروا يوصلوا فيه عشان يقدروا يستخدموا بياناتهم. Access or accessibility. The employees will be given access to the section of data based on their company's security policies. The same data cannot be accessed by other employees. بيانات اللي نوصلونها نحنا مثلاً في سكشن معين 
البيانات نفسها ممكن من جهه اخرى او شخص اخر مش حيقدر يستخدمها لان في نسبه حمايه يعني انكريبشن تكنيكس نستخدمه في تكنيكس تاع تشفير عشان تصير العمليه هذه الستورج الداتا اللي تخزنها مي هاف ون ميني ايشوز ون ايشو از ريلايبيلتي اوف داتا ستورج السولوشنز للسكيورتي تشالنجز اللي حكيت عليهم الحلول الانكريبشن از سجستد از ا بيتر سولوشن تو انشور تو سكيور انفورميشن التشفير هي افضل حل لتامين البيانات قبل ما نخزنوا البيانات في كلاود سيرفر لازم نشفروهم او مش لازم يعني مفضل ان نشفروهم في الجوريثمز نستخدموه للتشفير اللي هي ال RSA وال Software as a Service RSA اللي هما ثلاث عالمين او اللي جايبين الفكرة اللي هما ريفست و شمير و ادمان اللي هما شن دارو دارو الجوريثم يستخدم لتشفير و فك التشفير بتاع المسجات ويستخدموا في كيز اللي هنا بابليك والبرايفت موضوعهم بروحه منفصل سوفتوير از ا سيرفيس هي الجوريثم تضمن ان في باوندريز اللي هن حدود يعني بين الفيزيكال اند ابلكيشن ليفل بين مستويات الفيزيكال والابلكيشن عشان نفصلوا بيانات فروم ديفرنت فروم ديفرنت يوزرز كونكلوجن Cloud computing is the new emerging technology that presents a good number of benefits to the users. The idea of cloud is to save a lot of time and money and to facilitate data accessibility. It faces a lot of security challenges. Cloud computing is a big security challenges. Solutions اللي اقترحت اللي هنا RSA وال Software as a Service. هذا النا references جبت من كم paper وإن شاء الله يكون بوستر مفيد لأن شيء مهم جدا وكلنا نستخدمه فيه. That's it. Hello everyone, here we will talk about intravenous injection or cannulation and let us start with our equipment. We will need gloves, prescribed medicine, alcohol swabs, cannula with required gauge, tourniquet, syringe with a flushing solution, dressing and plaster and sharp biohazard waste container. And now we will start our procedure with hand washing, keep it clean and dry, then you have to introduce yourself to the patient, explain the procedure and gain the consent. Then after gathering our equipment and choosing the right size of the cannula, position the arm most comfortable to the patient and and identify the vein. Then apply the tourniquet and put on your gloves. Then you have to clean the patient's skin and let it dry. Now we will insert the cannula at approximately 30 degree. After that advance the cannula until flashback is seen at the base. The needle should be held stationary whilst the plastic component of the cannula is advanced further into the vein until the plastic tube is fully inserted. At the same time, you have to remove the tourniquet and remove the needle from the base of the cannula, leaving the plastic component. Take the bung and insert it into the end of the cannula. Secure the cannula with the dressing. Flush the cannula with the flushing solution. Dispose of the sharps and any other waste safely. And in the end, document the procedure. 
But don't forget to thank the patient. Thank you, everyone. وفي الختام نتقدم بشكر جزيل لكل من شارك في إعداد وتقديم هذا العمل متمنين أن نكون قد وفقنا في تقديم كل ما هو مفيد وحتى الملتقى في العام القادم إن شاء الله لكم منا كل المنى حفظ الله بلادنا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته فكنا الضياء بشمس فتية وجئنا الطبيب لدمح السقام فنحن بني الجامعة